palimpsest, discrete archaeological layers of a life to be excavated like the different levels of old Troy, where, at some point beneath those cities upon cities, one hopes to find Achilles and his beloved Patroclus, and all that wrath with which our world began. I am writing this on August 26, 1994, glumly, avoiding a tempting lie of convenience. Since I usually like to keep the present in the present tense, I wanted to note that today, after the hottest summer ever in southern Italy, the heat wave broke. But it was not today but yesterday that the weather changed. From our house here in Ravello, on a cliff above the Gulf of Salerno, there was a lightning storm to the west and another to the east, and a sudden gale that has filled the house with dried leaves. I am now cool for the first time in two months, and able to contemplate what I've been writing for the last two years, a description of the first thirty-nine years of my life as viewed from twenty-nine years later. I have always been curious to know where writers are physically situated when they write memoirs. Their placement in works of the imagination is less interesting, because the true geography of a novel is all in the mind. But a memoir is set off by a thousand associations, often by objects in a given room. The room where I work is a white cube with an arched ceiling and a window to my left that looks across the Gulf of Salerno toward Paestum. At the moment, metallic gray sea and a white haze that obscures our ever more hostile sun. Several volumes of Mark Twain are piled on a nearby table. I am about to write a preface to his anti-imperial writings. Also, shall I or shall I not, review the first-person narrations of the two principal spin-masters in the last presidential election. He told lies for Clinton, she for Bush. Then they got married. Is there a moral? So, opposite me, there is a large gray tufa stone fireplace with elaborate green-yellow-blue tiles. On a console to its right, a photograph of Tennessee Williams with Maria St. Just. She died a few months ago, and her daughter has been staying here. Tennessee looks away from Maria, who looks at him. This was long ago, in Key West. On the other side of the fireplace, a photograph of me with the president who did us the most harm, Harry S. Truman. More on him later. Truman has come to Poughkeepsie to speak for me in my race for Congress. It is the year 1960. I gaze fawningly upon him while, all about us, the flower of Tammany Hall stares straight ahead. Then a photograph of me welcoming Jack Kennedy to Dutchess County. He has just been nominated for president. We are both very young, to state the obvious. By the door, two framed documents— my honorary citizenship of Ravello, and my honorary citizenship of Los Angeles, the one and the other of my home towns. A week ago, in the gardens of the Villa Cimbrone, just above our place, the town had planned an homage to the films that I have written. Characteristically, they began with Bob Roberts, a film in which I only act. Since the writer-star-director Tim Robbins and his friend Susan Sarandon were staying with us, it ended up as an homage to Tim, which was just as well, though Italy's latest minister of culture, Vittorio Scarbi, a colorful art historian and television personality, was still able to continue his long public debate with me on who makes the movies. This is a subject which everyone knows all about except those of us who have actually made a film. Recently, a television interviewer quoted me as having said, I seem to have met everyone, but I know no one. Grinning like a tiger in anticipation of antelope, she leaned forward, gently salivating, eager to hear a tragic sigh, see a tear of self-pity. Plainly, due to my high and solitary place in the world, am I not the living Buddha, or is that Richard Gere? 
And to my cold nature and to my refusal to conform to warm, mature family values, I am doomed to be the eternal outsider, the black sheep among those great good white flocks of folks who graze contentedly in the amber fields of the Republic. I told her briskly that I had never wanted to meet most of the people that I had met, and the fact that I never got to know most of them took dedication and steadfastness on my part. By choice and luck, my life has been spent reading other people's books and making sentences for my own. More to the point, if you have known one person, you have known them all. Of course, I am not so sure that I have ever known even one person well, but— as the Greeks sensibly believed, should you get to know yourself, you will have penetrated as much of the human mystery as anyone need ever know. A memoir is how one remembers one's own life, while an autobiography is history, requiring research, dates, facts, double-checked. I met the playwright John Osborne a year ago, and I told him, with more sincerity than such encounters require, that I had read with delight his two volumes of memoirs. The ongoing portrait of his mother was particularly fine. An unrelenting monster, she is impervious to everything about her and, like all great comic characters, never out of character. Did you take notes or keep a diary along life's tumultuous way? I asked in the sepulchral tone we memoirists use when confronting each other in one or another of the many chambers of the charnel house of truth. Good God, no. Actually, I think I make it all up. Osborne is, alas, was, he died a few months after I wrote this, an elegant, mustached figure, colorfully tweeded and ascotted, or did he wear the proud tie of some school or regiment yet to be founded or formed? Plainly, he starts with an emotion, usually vivid in its dislike of, let us say, a less than satisfactory wife. Then he taps into the emotion, makes sentences, scenes, a work. This, of course, is the way that most naturalistic fiction is written. Unfortunately, the Osborne method is of no great use to me. I gave up naturalism years ago. I either create, out of air, a parallel Duluthian universe, or I recreate, from agreed-upon facts, a figure like Abraham Lincoln. Since a memoir is a memory of those things that one recalls, one can't describe what never happened, as I described my governorship of Alaska in Screening History. Worse, how am I to reconstruct myself, or rather, my memory of now shadowy events, when, except for thirteen green pages of notes from 1961 and a diary kept for a month or two in 1948, I have made no record of my own days and must rely either on an idle memory or on what others have written about me? I used to say, proudly, that I would never write a memoir since I am not my own subject. Now I'm not so sure. After all, one's recollected life is just about all that's left at the end of the day when the work is done and gone, property now of others. I may not have known well any of the characters in this drama, but I was certainly more interested in my view of them than I was in any view of myself. Unlike so many diarists, memoirists, and self-invented fabulists. Yet, reading their records, true or false, my own memory is stirred in a non-sequential way. I also record daily life so that it can trigger memory, in the hope that the resulting narratives, impressions, sentences, should make a pattern not visible to me now. Title? Palimpsest. For years I've used this obscure word incorrectly. Worse, I've always mispronounced it, not sounding the second S. I had thought that the word was applicable only to architecture, like the wall of San Marco at Venice with its fragments of bas-reliefs, bits of porphyry, shards of ceramic, all set in plaster to form a palimpsest. I have just now looked up the earliest meaning of palimpsest, it is even more apt than I thought. 
paper, parchment, etc., prepared for writing on and wiping out again like a slate, and a parchment, etc., which has been written upon twice, the original writing having been rubbed out. This is pretty much what my kind of writer does anyway. Starts with life, makes a text, then a revision, literally a second seeing, an afterthought, erasing some but not all of the original while writing something new over the first layer of text. Finally, in a memoir, there are many rubbings out and puttings in, or, as I once observed to Dwight MacDonald, who had found me disappointingly conventional on some point, I have nothing to say, only to add. It seems that practically everyone that I have ever met is now the subject of at least one biography, and in the case of my ancient friend Paul Bowles, whose life was mostly spent in the company of people more famous than he, a small library is now devoted to him and to those whom he knew. I have never known quite what to do about biographers. Usually I say that I have nothing more to say if I have ever written on the subject. As for my own sacred story, I entrusted it to a journalist who— after hundreds of interviews with the quick and the slow, and now often the dead and the gone, produced not a page in nine years. In one sense, his scam was ideal for me. He kept others at bay. These memories were recorded during 1993 and 1994. Now I palimpsest. I erase the next few lines and write. I am rereading this a year later. The journalist gave way to the biographer Fred Kaplan. Then the journalist died, and I started on this series of glimpses of an earlier self. Meanwhile, almost daily, requests arrive from biographers of, well, who's at hand? Carson McCullers, Mary McCarthy, Tennessee Williams, William Faulkner. Thank God I never met Hemingway. J.F. Kennedy, Truman Capote, Antony Tudor, Anna E. Sneen. Rod Serling. Apparently there is no one so obscure that he or she has not at least one biographer. But then that is the order of the day. As fiction ceases to give pleasure, biographies, that is to say, mega-fiction, sometimes posing as gossip, has come into its terrible own. I go back and forth between the present, now already past, to people and places that I knew long ago— duly noting along the way a number of familiar selves, some more real than others. Before the cards that one is dealt by life are the cards that fate has dealt, one's family. I am in a narrow tunnel, wriggling toward the light, but I get stuck before my head is free of the tunnel. I cannot move forward or backward. I wake up in a sweat. Nina's pelvis was narrow, and I was delivered clumsily, with forceps, by a doctor not used to deliveries. He was officer of the day in the cadet hospital at West Point, on a Saturday, October 3rd, 1925, at about noon. Some weeks later, Eugene Luther Vidal, West Point class of 1918, resigned as first lieutenant in the Army. He had been the Academy's first instructor in aeronautics, as well as football coach. In 1917, he had been an All-American quarterback, as well as a track star who had taken part in the Olympic Games at Antwerp. Jean, Nina, and Child moved into her parents' house in Washington, thus richly ensuring the failure of that marriage. My first memory is of early evening in a room that overlooked the driveway of my grandfather's house in Washington, D.C.'s Rock Creek Park. I am standing up in a playpen, euphemism for cage. I stick my head between the slats of the pen, get stuck, roar. Someone comes and I am freed. For a child, like a cat, the place where it lives is often more important than the people who live there. Rock Creek Park was very much my territory. The house itself was gray-yellow, Baltimore stone. On one side, there was a steep lawn that overlooked a broad branch road and the winding creek, 
while on the other side there was the front door, approached by a circular drive at whose center was a small fountain. In those days, from the house, one saw only green woods, a rose garden, rows of flags, as we called irises, and a small vineyard of purple grapes. At the edge of the woods was a slave cabin falling to pieces. In the heart of the woods there was a spring of cold water that one was warned even then not to drink. Magically, water bubbled from soft gray sand, which I used to build elaborate sand cities, usually in the style of those I'd read about in Lane's translation of the Arabian Nights, a book I never ceased to read and reread. The main hall smells of fried bacon, floor wax, irises, books, thousands of dusty books. To the right of the hall, a living room with a large bay window framed by bookcases. I recall a set of Mark Twain and a set of Voltaire in a red binding. There is a large dining room on the left with a fireplace and a niche on either side in which there are two tall, gaudy, pink and gold Sevres vases. Back of the screen, there is the door to the large white kitchen, where the large, dark Gertrude Jackson presides. I used to watch her cook by the hour, telling her stories that I made up as I went along. She was stout from Maryland's eastern shore. She was also sly. She stole a gold pin from Nina and then, a year or two later, absent-mindedly wore it to work. We all thought that the loss of her cooking was rather more serious than that of a gold pin. They also had a black manservant, Lewis, who was very effeminate, with a lisp. I liked him. Years later, when I came to know Jimmy Baldwin, I thought he was Lewis born again, but without the lisp. When my uncle, Tom Gore, left his watch on the wash basin, I stole it. There was a great fuss. I have no idea why I took the watch. I had no interest in watches then or now, but when I realized the gravity of what I had done, I knew that it would take some ingenuity to undo the crime. So I hid the watch under a bush in a nearby playground. Then, when Lewis and I passed the bush on the way to market, I pretended to find the watch. Look, I exclaimed, with true acting flair, or so I thought. A watch! I was distressed when everyone saw through what I took to be a superbly executed stratagem. A half-brother has just sent me the letters that I wrote my father. I am touched that Jean, my father, kept them. But then, in the forty-three years that we knew each other, we never agreed on much of anything, and never once quarreled. Jean's older sister used to complain, You aren't like father and son, you're like two brothers, off together, making fun of the rest of us, which was just about right. Eugene L. Vidal was born April 13, 1895, in Madison, South Dakota. At the University of South Dakota, he was so formidable a football player that he was appointed to, that is, acquired by, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Despite his training as an engineer at West Point, he had a divergent mind. In 1917, he went into the newly constituted Air Corps as a pilot, a glamorous thing to be in those days. Then, with Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart, he helped found three airlines, TWA, Eastern, and Northeast. He liked creating things. He had no interest in making money, and he made no fortune. My letters are strewn across a table. There are several copies of Jean's replies to me, neatly typed on crumbling brown paper. There are also several pages of what looks to be a transcribed interview with him on the early days of aviation. As President Roosevelt's director of air commerce in the 30s, Jean got to know Orville Wright, the surviving brother of the two inventors of the airplane. Orville and Wilbur Wright were lifelong bachelors, as Time magazine used to write when eager to suggest uranism. At random, I pick up a page from Jean's recollections. I often visited Orville Wright at his home, and we talked a great deal about their early problems. I asked him what was their most serious problem in developing the first powered airplane. To my surprise, he said the design of the propeller. 
He said there were almost no books or papers on the subject. A year or so after the first flight, he and Wilbur discussed the matter of sitting up while in flight and decided to try it. He told me it was some time later that they got the idea of using wheels for takeoff, landing, and handling the machine on the ground. Years went by, perhaps twenty, before airplanes had brakes. Yet automobiles had brakes from the beginning. It was my father's dream to be the Henry Ford of aviation. He wanted to develop a cheap plane that anyone who could afford a car could own, and was simple enough for even a child to fly. Thus I was made famous for an instant in my tenth year when, together, we drove out to Bowling Field, where the so-called Hammond Fliver plane was on the tarmac, as well as a newsreel crew from Pathé News. Gene was a superb salesman. He knew that I was so used to flying with him that taking off and landing a boy-proof plane was no problem for me. But my not-so-secret dream of being a movie star could now be consummated, he told me, in the newsreels. I flew the plane, made a bumpy landing, then, overcome by stage fright, I froze before the camera as I was supposed to say, against my will, that the flight had been just as easy as riding a bicycle. I still watch this old newsreel and wonder how that blonde boy was ever me, or that astonishingly handsome stranger, my father. The year before my newsreel debut, my life had changed drastically. Jean and Nina were divorced, and Nina and I settled into a two-room flat in Washington, D.C.'s Wardman Park Hotel, I slept on a sofa in an alcove off the living room and made my own breakfast in a small kitchen while Nina worked her way through the stations of the cross of her homely morning hangover. Later, a bus would take me to my school, St. Albans. I was, for a time, being bullied by a larger boy named Tommy Hopkins. Nina gave me a metal dog's leash. Hit him with this. I did, and nearly knocked out his left eye. That dog leash still haunts me, like Cocteau's lethal snowball. Another boy, caught masturbating, told his mother that I had taught him. Nina took this very seriously. I had no idea what she was talking about. Then, one day, I set fire to a pile of cardboard boxes on the sidewalk in front of the house. The police came, then went away. What was my sudden, promptly extinguished pyromania all about? A signal, I now think. Send me home to the gores. Life was unbearable with Nina raging at Jean, who would, smiling, simply vanish, leaving me for her to rage at. On my tenth birthday, Jean paid us a call and presented me with a signet ring. Then I went off to bed while Jean and Nina, on rather better terms since the divorce than before, discussed me. I listened smugly as Nina confided, I think I've done a pretty good job. I felt very complacent indeed as Nina congratulated herself on her success as a single parent, while Jean politely agreed with her. Then they discussed money, an urgent subject, always with her, and one of no interest to him or me. I fell asleep. I gather now that what they had really discussed was the necessity of her marriage to Hugh D. Auchincloss. One month later, Nina and Hudie were married in the hotel. Then, later that night, she and I moved into Marywood, where I knew no one except for my new stepfather. I was quite used to being very much the only child at my grandparents' house in Rock Creek Park, and so I did not crave the company of other little folk, particularly my new stepbrother, Yusha. In due course, I moved myself out of the attic and into the small bedroom at the head of the stairs on the second floor. Nina's bedroom was at one end of the landing. Next to it, ominously as it turned out, was Hudie's. Nina had made an informal prenuptial agreement with Hudie. She would marry him in order to bring glamour, he had a passion for senators, into his life, and to be a good stepmother to his forlorn child. But since she did not care for him that way, theirs would be a mariage blanc. Crafty Hudie agreed. 
Then he made a formal prenuptial agreement that she be given a fixed income for life, and never anything more. Apparently, he had had to pay too much to Nina's predecessor, a colorful Russian lady who had been accidentally scalped by an airplane propeller. Delirious in the hospital, she spoke of the true love of her life, whose name was not Hudi. When she recovered, Hudi divorced her, and she married her true lover and lived happily ever after. Something poor Hudi did not. Obsessively, Hudi had fixed his gaze upon my mother, who was otherwise engaged, or so she believed. The ill-matched, wealthy Mr. and Mrs. John Hay Whitney Jock and Liz, and the star-crossed, fortuneless Mr. and Mrs. Eugene Luther Vidal had been, as they say at dances, double-cutting for some time. Everyone assumed that once the unhappy couples broke up, Nina would marry Jock and Liz would marry Jean. I went with Nina to the T.H. Ranch outside Reno, Nevada, where Phase 1, divorce, was to take place. Suddenly there was Hudi, looking out of place in his banker's suit. Some years earlier, his mother had bought him a brokerage house. Nina asked me if I'd like him for a stepfather. I said no, largely on aesthetic grounds. After my father, the large, cumbersome, stammering Hudi was simply neither plausible nor decorative. Even if I had entirely grasped the necessity of a fortune for feckless Nina, I don't think that I would have been impressed. If it was to be big money, I preferred jocks. After we came back to Washington, Nina still expected to marry Mr. John Hay Whitney, while Mrs. John Hay Whitney still expected to marry my father. As it turned out, my father said no to the glamorous Liz, to my sorrow. Liz was a celebrated horsewoman, looked like an Indian princess, made a screen test to play Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind, which would eventually be produced by Jock's movie partner, David O. Selznick. Jock said no to Nina, leaving her high, if never entirely dry. Since her father, Senator Thomas Pryor Gore, was facing a difficult primary in Oklahoma and had no money to spare, my mother was obliged to say yes to the persistent Hudi. Nina would be poor no more. Best of all, it was understood from the beginning that there would be no sex. So, in the dark of night, we were whisked across the river to the unfinished Merrywood, a mock Georgian brick house set among some forty acres of woods on the high Potomac Palisades. From terraced lawns there was a steep rocky drop to the river, down which it was dangerous to walk, much less run, and so, of course, I often ran this hazardous course, leaping from rock to rock. To this day I still dream of making that descent to the swift, mud-brown, swirling river, going faster and faster ecstatically unable to stop until dreams end. I also recall the sharp smell of new paint inside the house and the rich supper prepared by a Russian chef from the Tsar's Winter Palace, where else all Russian cooks of that day were so billed. For the first time I saw gold-spun sugar. We were served by an amiable Russian butler named Afranazi, who taught me to count to ten in Russian, which was just about as long as it took my mother to get rid of him and the other relics of her predecessor's regime. At about six in the morning of the day after my mother's marriage to Hudi, I found Nina seated on the steps wearing a dark gray silk dressing gown with a burgundy stripe. I, who never notice what anyone wears, often have a good visual recall of crucial scenes. Not long ago I described that dressing gown to a lady knowledgeable in such things. Bergdorf Goodman, 1935. Thus, briskly, the picture was captioned. Years later Nina told me that the white marriage she had agreed to had turned very black indeed the first night. I should note that the only advantage for a child in having an alcoholic parent is that you acquire, prematurely, Quite a bit of valuable data. Apparently, there was going to be sex whether Nina liked it or not. She did not like it. 
but then no woman could have liked Hudie's importunate fumblings. He ejaculated normally, but without that precedent erection which women require, as, if nothing else, totemic symbol of a man's true love, not to mention a homely source of hedonistic friction. Since Hudie wanted children, Nina was obliged, in some fashion, that she, on several occasions in her admittedly never-long-empty cups, vividly described to me and I would promptly erase from memory. I think she inserted, with a spoon, what she called the bugs, in order to create my demi-siblings. He had, incidentally, a superb collection of pornographic books that Nina obliged him to drown like kittens in the Potomac River to protect the innocence of the two growing boys in the house. Fortunately, he had held back a few, which I found. Ominously, I would be warned to turn over a new leaf. This usually preceded my being sent off to yet another school, even farther from home than the last. Meanwhile, it was necessary for her to keep me as far away as possible. In addition to her drinking, she was now a morphine addict. She was also becoming reckless. One afternoon, the children's nurse, Mrs. Goodman, caught her smuggling a black cab driver into her bedroom. It was the black that upset Goody, a southerner, not his profession or Nina's idle lust. I think what Nina instinctively most feared was an intelligent witness. From here on out, Nina would announce, at regular intervals for the rest of her life, I'm looking out for number one. Like most dedicated drinkers, she could not spare the time to go to the movies, but she was quick to appropriate Argot. At the T.H. ranch, she had been all-girl cowhand. Stop beefing, she would roar at any complaint that I might make. You're always bellyaching. A man's woman. No doubt about that. Curiously, my father alludes to her competitiveness in a letter to me shortly after his second child by his second wife is born. Nina will probably have another now, since she won't want to be tied. Plainly, we all had her number. Even so. Howard has just asked me why I bothered with her at all. I don't really know. But I am beginning to think that she knew how to play on a sadistic streak in me that would, once awakened, impel me to detonate the Queen Lear of the lobby in order to revel in her howlings. If true, that would be a victory for her. Recently I lectured at Harvard on how we are shaped by the movies we see while growing up. In preparation for the lectures, I watched The Prince and the Pauper for the first time since 1937. Like most of the movies that impress themselves on a child, the story is simple, but the subtexts are disturbingly complex if one is the right age to be affected by them. The Prince and the Pauper were played by Bobby and Billy Mock, identical twins who were the same age as I, twelve. So there was I, in surrogate, on the screen not once but twice, not only prince but pauper, and the two of them, of us, were so alike as to be interchangeable as well. I do not know if a desire to be a twin is a common one, or if such a longing might run in families, psychically as well as genetically. My grandmother Gore lost her twin at birth, and it required no uncanny knowledge of the human heart for the family to figure out that when she took over the task of being not only wife but eyes to a blind husband, she had found in him her long-lost twin. A cousin has just sent me a 1936 newsreel of my grandfather's last campaign for the Senate. Thomas Pryor Gore looks and sounds weary. He predicts the coming of the Second World War, and he reminds the electorate that he is the last remaining member of the Senate of 1917, and that as he had opposed American intervention in the war then, so he does now. I will not sacrifice your sons to the dogs of war. Much of the first ten years of my life was spent on the hill above Broad Branch Road, the branch being Rock Creek itself, a clear, pure stream that rushed shallowly over rocks between wooded hills. 
a haven for salamanders and all sorts of freshwater life. Senator Gore owned three acres of woods above the creek where, shortly before my birth, he had built a gray stone mansion. The senator called his wife Tot, which I rendered as Dot. To her, he was Dad, which I rendered as Da, an Irish locution, I am told. Her first name was Nina. I never heard her call the senator by his first name except once, when they were in the small sitting room off their bedroom. He wore a long nightshirt, and she was in her usual uniform, a pale pink wrapper over a lace nightdress. Since he could not see her, she never bothered with her appearance unless there was company. While reading to him, she noticed that his nightshirt had ridden up to his knees. Put your dress down, Tom, she said. Otherwise, he was Dad or Mr. Gore. No one that I know of ever called him Tom or Thomas. President Roosevelt, in his Squire of the Manor way, addressed him once, and once only, as Tom. The senator ignored him until he was addressed properly. As a boy in Mississippi, he had been called Gov, short for Governor, tribute to an ambition that was noticeable even then. There seems never to have been a time that he was not in demand as an eloquent and witty speaker, particularly at those political picnics, which were one of the few communal pleasures during harsh Reconstruction days. He was born in 1870 among the ruins of Walthall, Mississippi. Yet even then, when the university degree was the principal dividing line between lawyers, teachers, divines, and the redneck peasantry, most of the Gore clan was educated. Not long ago, I visited the house where he was born, set in lush green, chigger-ridden countryside. There is a large parlor with a fireplace, from whose wooden mantelpiece he had detached a sliver. I was here, said the old woman who owns the house today, when the senator came home. You know, he had said when he left Mississippi that he would never come back unless he could come back as a United States senator. Well, he was true to his word. Everyone was very excited. Then he came out here and asked my father if he could have a piece off the old mantle. Through the middle of the house there is a covered open-ended breezeway, a traditional means in the south of cooling a house, as what air there is sweeps through, providing some relief during the equatorial summers. I stood in the small bedroom where Gore was born, felt nothing. Then I went over to the courthouse, where his father had been chancery clerk, and I sat on the same steps where his father had sat all one day in 1861, trying to decide whether or not to join his brothers and friends in a Mississippi rifle company. The Gores were Unionists, and if they had lived across the nearby border in Tennessee, they would have fought for the Union. As it was, reluctantly, they fought for one another rather than for slavery, which they despised, or for the ill-starred Confederacy. The Gores belonged to the party of the people, hence populists. T.P. Gore's father was a clerk of Walthall County, an elected post of peculiar power in that state, a sort of regional chancellor. Since there were few blacks in north-central Mississippi, Gores have never been slaveholders, unlike Dot's father's family, the Kays of South Carolina, or her mother's family, the McLaughlins of Meridian, Mississippi. I still remember how my mother used to just step out of her clothes in her bedroom at night and leave them right there on the floor, wherever she happened to be standing, and, of course, I'd have to come along and put them away. You see, before the war, there was always a slave girl to take care of her. Dot and Da complimented each other. She was dark, with large eyes and high-arched brows. She was also small, hence taut. She had a beautiful low speaking voice. When Da first heard it at a political picnic in Palestine, Texas, where her family had moved after the war, he said, I'm going to marry you. He was a 25-year-old blind lawyer, practicing law with his father and two brothers. A woman journalist rattles away. How did he become blind? We have all told this particular story so many times that we can recite it without thinking. Eight years old, throwing nails at a cow. Another boy's nail misses, hits Gov's eye. Still has one good eye. 
partial but fading vision in the damaged eye. Age 10, appointed page to the Mississippi State Senate at Jackson. Boards in a state senator's house. Son of house has a birthday. Gov brings him a gun. When you pull the trigger, a spike comes out. Doesn't work. Gov holds it to his good eye to see what's wrong. Now I'm blind, were his first words after the spike found its target. From Da's letter to me on my 15th birthday, I compare or contrast your opportunities now with mine when I was your age, and I all but envy you. I lived 30 miles from the railroad and attended a school which ran about four or five months a year. In a building 30 by 50, there was no fifth dimension. Nevertheless, by then, he had freed himself of that religion which was, and still is, a terrible blight in his part of the world. At nine or ten, told that if he had faith he could fly, he attached cornstalks to his arms and climbed out onto the roof of a barn and took off to fly around the world. He broke his collarbone. Later, when his father decided to abandon the family Methodism for the Campbellite variant of fundamentalism, the family was ordered to choose its brand. The mother stayed as she was. Two children became Campbellites, for father's sake. Gore turned atheist, a daring thing to do then, and now, in Mississippi. On the other hand, he did not let it be generally known that he was a non-believer. If he had, he could not have had a political career, a conundrum that he liked. Can God, the all-powerful, do anything? Yay! Yay! No, he can't. What can't he do? Can't make a year-old heifer in a minute. Of course he can. Why, in just a minute, there it is. Yes, but no matter how big that heifer is, it's still only a minute old and not a year. The family wanted to put him in a school for the handicapped. No, I'm going to study law. How? Send someone to school with me, to read to me. A relative named Pittman went with him to the Lebanon School of Law in Tennessee. Gore learned to memorize what was read to him, including endless statistics, learned to recognize people by their voices, was not surprised when radar was developed in World War II. All blind people know about radar. You can feel the sound waves bounce off a wall up ahead of you. Gives you warning. Woman journalist has a tinkling laugh. Da winces. Is there any sound more dreadful than that of a woman's laugh, he would say. A mild misogynist, he was a true misanthrope which the public never guessed as they gazed on his serene, kindly face with its crooked, thin-lipped smile and the blind gray eyes, one was glass, that had a surprising amount of life to them, particularly when he was about to launch a devastating line. You must admit, said the journalist, that when you lose your sight, your other faculties develop, so there have to be compensations. There are no compensations, Da said grimly particularly for someone whose greatest pleasure in life was reading. He was read to almost every minute of the day. Once Senate or legal work was out of the way, he turned to history, poetry, economics. He disliked novels. Dot, two secretaries, and, later, I, were the principal readers. As our spirits would sometimes start to fail, he would observe blithely, both Milton's daughters went blind reading to him. Early in his career, he liked to hold notes in his hand that he would pretend to consult in order to disguise the little-known, at the time, fact that he was totally blind. I still cannot get over the wonder of film. I have now seen and heard a man I would not seen and heard for almost half a century. It is a sort of miracle and a powerful aid to memory. He had, surprisingly, a gift for mathematics. At one point he had been offered a job at a university teaching mathematics, but I couldn't take a job like that. When I think of teaching in a school, I get this lonesome feeling. After losing a campaign for election to the Mississippi legislature, he had left the state. The campaign had been unusually dirty. Gore boarded in a house where also lived a blind girl. She became pregnant 
and the blind boarder was accused of seduction by the blind girl's guardian. A shotgun was produced in the best tradition of Cavalleria Rusticana. Gore walked away. Shoot, he said, his back to the guardian. But I'm not marrying her. Thanks to the scandal, he lost a congressional election, but one dot. Also, rather more to the point, he was already bound for the United States Senate. This meant that he must leave Mississippi, where one had to wait for an incumbent to die, which could be decades. Much too long a time for a man in a hurry. First, he headed west to Texas. A group of Baptist elders approached him and offered him a fine church and house in Houston if he would become their minister. He thanked them and said that the offer was very fine indeed, but he couldn't take it as he didn't believe in God. Come now, Mr. Gore, that's not the proposition we made you, is it? Then on to the Indian territories, where he helped organize the state of Oklahoma. The only reason I was born was that rats had chewed on Mother's douchebag, or so she told me. This was an essential starting point to the Nina story. As it was established very early in her saga, there was probably some truth to it. Dot's time was fully occupied looking after and reading to her blind husband. Should they ever fall on hard times, a constant fear, children would have been a nuisance or worse. So thanks to the torn douchebag, Nina was born in the summer of 1903 in Lawton, Indian Territory. Da and his friends did not make the territory a state until 1907, when, at 38, he was elected to the U.S. Senate. They moved to Washington, to Mintwood Place, high above Rock Creek Park. Nina was sent to Holton Arms, a good girls' school. She was dark, with hazel eyes, high-arched brows, thin lips, and a propensity for alcohol, which did not become out of control until she was in her thirties. Over the years, she would stop drinking for a month or two and work with Marty Mann, a founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. I note in the biography of Marlon Brando that his mother, equally alcoholic, also worked, when sober, with Miss Mann. Sober, Nina was candid. I first thought something might be wrong when I was still married to Jean, and after a party, I'd go around and finish whatever was left in all the glasses. Dot and Da, true Southerners, worshipped at the Shrine of Education, the only way that they knew of for a Southerner to rise during Reconstruction. They were not worldly enough to know that in Washington, a handsome, well-placed, if penniless, young woman like Nina, and later, like Jackie and Lee, were expected to marry money, which made useless a degree in accounting or Western civilization. Nina met Jean Vidal after a football game in 1921. They were at different tables in a child's restaurant in Manhattan. He was a football coach at the United States Military Academy, as well as sole instructor in aeronautics. He was 26. She was 18. Someone introduced them. Love at first sight, on her side, anyway. He called her Pup. They were married in 1923 at St. Margaret's Church, Washington, in the presence of the disapproving senator and Mrs. Gore. Nina was still a virgin. On the honeymoon train, he said, There's something very important I want you to know. Oh, I was so excited, she said to me years later during one of our truces. He's going to tell me he loves me. But he didn't. Instead, he said, I have three balls. Apparently, he was in all the medical books. I never dared look. You don't look at parents, but it is recorded that they were all of equal size. On the town, with football buddies, they used to bet other tables of athletes who had the most balls. West Point always won. From Nina's long deposition to Time magazine, when Gore was six weeks old, I took him to my parents' home in Washington, and we lived there until he was nine. Actually, when Jean joined Roosevelt's administration, he took a house for us on Bancroft Place, where Nina entertained as royally as they could afford, drinking up the leftovers, while Jean would go out for chocolate ice cream, which he'd then share with me. From the deposition, 
Gore's father, a charming man, Eugene Vidal, was not equipped for civilian life. He had graduated from the University of South Dakota and was proselytized for West Point because of his athletic abilities at football and track. This was true, but he also graduated in the top 5% of his class at the academy. His first civilian position was with Transcontinental Air Transport, which I got for him through a friend of mine, Burdett Wright of Curtis Wright in Buffalo. Gene was fired from this. As always, it's not what you know, it's who you know. But Wright had nothing to do with TAT. In 1929, one C.M. Keys combined a couple of airlines and started TAT. For a quarter million dollars cash, Keyes hired, as consultant, Charles Lindbergh. He also gave the Lone Eagle shrewd advice on how to avoid income tax. Thus, TAT was dubbed the Lindbergh Line. Keyes was perhaps the first true hustler or robber baron in American aviation. TAT also acquired ex-airmail flyer Paul Collins and Army flyer Jean Vidal. Like most of the early airlines, TAT was a combined air-rail service. Passenger planes did not fly at night or over the turbulent Alleghenies. On a TAT transcontinental flight, the passengers left New York by rail in the evening, then in Columbus, Ohio, the eight passengers boarded a Ford trimotor and flew to Waynoka, Oklahoma. Here they transferred to the Santa Fe Railroad for an overnight haul to Clovis, New Mexico, where another plane flew them into Los Angeles, or Burbank, to be precise. It is a tribute to the faith of these pioneers that they truly believed this grueling two-day journey would, in time, be preferable to the comforts of a Pullman railroad car. Paul Collins describes the end of TAT in Tales of an Old Air-Faring Man. About Christmas time, 1929, all the St. Louis executives were called to a meeting in New York. We were introduced in Mr. Keyes's office to one Jack Maddox, president of Maddox Airlines, an operation that flew from Los Angeles to San Francisco. Mr. Keyes stated that a merger had been effected between TAT and Maddox. The ineffable Keyes then waited until the assembled management of TAT had returned to St. Louis, where they were all fired. I've just come across a clipping from what looks to be the Washington Post. It is 1930, and the reporter pays a call on the recently re-elected senator who is babysitting me. At five, I am still called Jean. Beside the fireplace, the senator's chair, and a smaller one where I would sit when I read to him, drinking Coca-Cola and trying not to let the ice tinkle. He forbade Coca-Cola in the house because it contained cocaine. Stacks of books around the blind senator's chair, piles and piles of them, all colors, all kinds. Last week, there was a fire in the house. The bookcases are being repainted. Baby Jean runs about among the stacks of books. The radio drones on. Tell me a story, da, begs little Jean, bored with his playthings. The senator, eyes tightly closed, says nothing. Da, insists the boy, shaking him. Oh, da! Please tell me a story. Silence. Immobility on Senator Gore's part. Duh, won't you tell me a story? Silence. Baby Jean regards his grandfather with interest, observes naively, Why do you keep your eyes closed? You can't see anything anyway. Senator Gore, amused, opens his blind eyes, begins sententiously, Once upon a time... Da was a wonderful storyteller. He also made me pay back in full when I was six by getting me to read to him, which I did by the hour for several years. Perversely, the senator, who had done his best to put his rural origins behind him, insisted on keeping chickens to impress visiting constituents, but as there was too much shade, they moped in the woods. I found them a bit dull, but I did my best to keep them amused. One day at table I was told, Eat your chicken. A terrible knowledge of Edenic magnitude filled me with horror. This? On the plate? The same? The same. 
I would not eat chicken for many years, despite my grandmother's cunning ways to trick me into what I took to be a form of cannibalism. Thomas Pryor Gore. He is seated in his heavy wood mission rocking chair, now in my bedroom at Ravello. He listens as the secretary reads to him. The straight but rather small chin is held high while the head is slightly tilted to one side. The blind eyes are tight shut with concentration. He has a full head of cowlicked white hair, a rosy, unlined face, and a large, straight, Anglo-Irish nose with the curious, flaring gore nostrils that most of us have inherited, including our young cousin who currently lives in vice presidential obscurity, a sort of family ghost flickering dimly on primetime television. Da is about five foot nine or ten. He stands very straight. He is well proportioned except for an astonishing stomach. A parabola begins at his rib cage and extends half a foot out in front of him before it abruptly rejoins the lower body. The stomach is hard as a rock. Dot would often touch it with wonder. When you're dead, I'm going to have this opened up. I've got to see what's in there. It's like iron, that stomach. Now I'm getting the same stomach, but much later in life, and thanks only to alcohol. Da himself never drank until old age, when doctors prescribed two shots before dinner. Both of his brothers were alcoholic in the best Confederate tradition. This meant that they functioned as lawyers all day, then, work done, they drank a great deal. So too, I fear, did Dot, to Da's distress. At dinner, she would begin to ramble in a story or slur her words, ending the meal by sneezing exactly five times and blowing her nose in the Irish linen napkin to my mother's fury. I have a newsreel of Da from 1931, the year that he came back to the Senate. He is standing in front of the Capitol with another senator, also blind. Clearly, an unpolitical human interest story was on the producer's mind. Gore's voice is measured precise, more southern than southwestern in accent, with an actor's phrasing. Lyndon Johnson used to imitate him, unsuccessfully. The Gore style influenced at least two generations of regional politicians. Much of his effect depended on a sharp, sudden wit that could surprise a crowd into laughter, very like his friend and fellow Chautauqua speaker Mark Twain. It is said that Will Rogers, in performance, most resembled Gore but I wouldn't know. Although I often led Da from his office onto the Senate floor and even into the Holy of Holies, the Senate cloakroom, I never heard him make a speech. It was a family complaint that when he was due to make a major speech in the Senate, he would tell none of us in advance. We would only know about it from the newspapers the next day. There was, of course, no television then, and newsreel cameras were not allowed in the chamber. Da ends the 1931 newsreel with an offhand, Nice to see you, straight to camera. Da had a curious position in the country, not unlike that of Helen Keller, a woman born deaf, mute, and blind. The response of each to calamity was a subject of great interest to the general public, and we children and grandchildren were treated not so much as descendants of just another politician, but as the privileged heirs to an inspirational personage. Politically, Gore always thought of himself as a member of the Party of the People, even after he had been co-opted by the Democrats, whose more or less populist tribune, William Jennings Bryan, would three times be a losing candidate for president. Although not unalike politically, Gore and Bryan got on uneasily. At Denver in 1908, when Gore seconded the nomination of Bryan for president, he started the longest demonstration in the history of American conventions. Gore made, as they used to say, the eagle scream. I suppose the magic was entirely in his performance, because the text... Well, as he himself said, a successful speech must reflect the people's mood at the time. He liked alliteration. I prefer the strenuosity of Roosevelt to the sinuosity of Taft, he would observe in 1912. After the Denver convention, Gore and Bryan drove away from the hall together 
an exuberant Brian said, You know, Senator, I ascribe my political success to just three things. Darwood paused dramatically at this point in the telling. Then, I'm afraid I don't remember a word he said, but I do remember wondering why he thought he was a political success. I've just been reading a book about the lawyer Clarence Darrow, and I'm surprised to note that when Darrow was defending two labor union officials accused of having blown up the Los Angeles Times building, who should show up in the courtroom but Senator Thomas Gore of Oklahoma, the famous blind U.S. senator, friend of Darrow, who was in town on a lecture tour. Plainly, populist Gore was showing solidarity with the cause of labor. As it turned out, the two labor leaders were guilty, and Darrow himself was later put on trial for bribing two jurors. But that is another story. The Gores were constantly struck by fate. Dot thought that Da had been born under a maleficent star. After all, the odds are very much against losing an eye in an accident, but to lose two eyes in two separate accidents is positively Lloydsian. But fate had many more freakish misadventures in store for him. At about the time Gore was visiting Clarence Darrow's courtroom, he was himself about to be tried for rape. Dot thought that this bit of melodrama was far and away fate's masterpiece. Although Gore was often helpful to the oil interests in the state, he was not paid off by them, unlike most of the delegation. He died a relatively poor man, something that no Oklahoma senator has ever done, particularly one who had, like Gore, written the original legislation for the depreciation of oil resources allowance that made the southwestern oil men as rich as today's Saudis and quite as unbearable. Now, here is the family's version of what happened. An oil company wanted to expropriate Indian land. They appealed to Congress. Gore took the Indian side. The oil men offered him money to change his vote. Without naming names, he announced to the Senate that he had been offered a bribe. I believe this was the first and perhaps last time that any senator broke one of the most powerful unwritten rules of the club. The resulting storm in the press did not scare off his tempters. Again, they threatened him, not a wise move in dealing with a man of so fierce and righteous a temper. He said that now he would charge them by name with bribery. So they played the badger game on him. A woman rang Gore's office to say that she was a constituent and that she would like to propose her son for an appointment to West Point. She was not able to come to the Capitol, but could he stop by her hotel on his way home? He did, in the company of his secretary, Roy Thompson. In the lobby, she proposed that the senator and she go to the less crowded mezzanine. Unaccompanied by Roy, she led Gore into her hotel room, where she started to scream and tear off her clothes. By prearrangement, a pair of detectives arrived, shouting, We've got you! The threat of exposure was thought to be quite enough to get the senator to cooperate. But he refused. Charges were brought against him. The newspaper scandal was enormous. Since the defendant may pick the venue of his trial, he, most daringly, chose to be tried in the capital of his state, Oklahoma City. Gore seemed certain to lose until the appearance of a surprise witness, a lady from Boston who had been at the window of a room opposite the one in which the rabid badger had been loosed, and she had seen and heard the woman tear at her own dress, had watched the detectives rush in. Gore was acquitted. But, as Dot said grimly, all our lives... Just as things start going well for us, something awful happens, and we have to begin all over again. Palimpsest Time Although I have pretty much kept to my system of recording only what a faulty memory recalls, and the written, equally faulty, memories and biographies of others, I did send away to the University of Oklahoma at Norman for the various accounts of T.P. Gore's alleged indecent assault on one Mrs. Minnie E. Bond in the Winston Hotel during March 1913 at Washington City. Minnie wanted $50,000 damages for the agony that she had undergone. Gore said he would not treat or retreat, and opted to stand trial in Oklahoma City. 
Now the story begins to diverge. Minnie had come to Washington to ask Senator Gore to appoint her husband internal revenue collector for the state. On three occasions, he said no. She asked to see him yet again. He told her to come to his office, but she said that she would prefer that he come to her hotel. He did, with his secretary escort, one of Dot's brothers. As the downstairs parlors were full, Minnie led the senator upstairs to what proved to be the bedroom of a Mister Jacobs. Then she tore her clothes and gave what the newspapers said was a loud squawk. Jacobs and two other witnesses, conveniently stationed nearby, rushed in. Gore had been framed. But reading the press accounts, I think I shall avoid the actual transcripts of the trial if they exist. I wonder why Dot's brother Harry K didn't go upstairs with him. But then I always wondered how on earth Da managed sex. A blind man can't go into a bar and, with a glance, find a partner. On February nineteenth, nineteen fourteen, the jury took ten minutes to exonerate the senator. In the course of the trial, the prosecution came up with a number of instances where Da had allegedly made advances to women, but none of the women ever stepped forward. The fact that he always had a brother-in-law or a man secretary as escort meant that he would have to rely on them for any arrangements which he might have made with women, not to mention guiding him to the men's room in a strange city. Nevertheless, there are odd discrepancies between the family version and what I have been reading. The famous surprise testimony of the lady from Boston, who had witnessed the whole thing from her hotel window opposite the one where the rape was supposed to have occurred, is entirely absent from the story. The jury simply said there was insufficient evidence to condemn Gore, and no one took seriously the stories of the three politically interested witnesses. It would seem that the actual reason for the frame-up involved an attorney named J. F. McMurray, who had involved himself in the transfer of some Indian lands and then sued the tribes for three million dollars in fees. Gore took the side of the Indians. McMurray did not get his money; hence, revenge in the generous form of Mrs. Minnie E. Bond. All this was par for the course in the frontier politics of the day. But more disturbing to me was the plaintiff's investigation of the blind girl and Gore in Corsicana, Texas, some twenty years earlier. The family story was that in 1895, the 25-year-old Gore was practicing law with father and brothers in Corsicana. Gore was also the party of the People's Candidate for the House of Representatives. He took music lessons from a young blind girl, the ward of a local couple. The music lessons sound truly far-fetched. Gore was tone deaf. Every time the national anthem was played, he invariably said, "Now there's a catchy tune." I cannot tell what is true and what is not true in the deposition of one S. P. Render, but the story is hair-raising. In 1914, Render found the blind girl in Galveston, Texas, where she was giving music lessons and living in genteel poverty. The Gores had, she told Render, thrown her out years earlier. As for the pregnancy, Gore was responsible. I was engaged to him, and I loved him as well as a child, for I was at that time in heart a child, in mind a child, but I did not submit to him of my own free will. He overpowered me, and I could do nothing. When she told him she was pregnant, he plied her with medicines, saying that the fever must break. When this failed to make her abort, some little instrument was used. Mister Render says that Gore was put on trial. Who was the plaintiff? For seduction and abortion, criminal offenses in Texas. Just before the trial, the blind girl told Render that Gore came to her and begged her to answer no questions at the trial on the ground that she would not only destroy his career but also the lives of his aged parents, who had never harmed anyone. Finally, she concedes, "The little one is gone. You could not shield him, and you have done all you can against me." And I said, "If you promise me you will be a better man, I will accede to your wishes." I don't see any good that could come in me doing otherwise, and then I was almost immediately conducted into the courtroom. 
I followed out his wishes as far as I could. Render adds that Gore, as a lawyer, knew that no court in Texas would send to prison a blind girl who refused to answer questions of the court. In the Bond case, the judge ruled that any previous adventures of either plaintiff or defendant could not be admitted as evidence. Was Gore guilty? In the Bond case, most unlikely. It was too obvious a political trap. In the blind girl case, he was indeed guilty, as his brother Ellis said after my 1960 television play, The Indestructible Mr. Gore, in which I followed the family line to Dot's dread until she saw the actual program, which delighted her. Ellis sourly noted that not only was Gov guilty as charged, but that he got their parents to take the girl as part of a deal made with her. I now understand why he resisted all biographers as well as publishers interested in memoirs. My life, he said to me, is a dull one, and there is so much that I cannot tell. Gore's personal triumph over blindness had become so powerful a myth in his own time that his actual political career was somewhat occluded, while his intellectual powers and wit, though duly acknowledged, were hardly treasured by the folk he represented, much less by Americans at large. There is no first-rate biography of him, thanks largely to Dot's carelessness with papers. In the attic at Rock Creek, most of his archives were strewn over the floor or stacked in trunks and broken boxes. Unable to see this mess, he probably didn't realize that his history was being erased through sloth. In the absence of primary texts, the Woodrow Wilson biographers seem not to have got much out of him. A.S. Link regards him as a political manipulator and not much more. But biographers of prophets tend to be proprietary of their great men, and Gore was always there to say no to ambitious transgression, whether in the name of the Republic, the common man, or the Almighty. Bryan's nomination in 1908 had, predictably, ensured a Republican victory. But as a leading populist Democrat in the Senate, Gore was now ready for a winner. He began to engineer an alliance between the populists of the South and Southwest and the big city bosses of the East. The result was the nomination of Woodrow Wilson, a one-term New Jersey governor who had sworn faithfully to serve the local bosses. Then, more in sorrow than in anger, he double-crossed them. Wilson's subsequent alliance with Bryan and Gore was a necessity for him and a convenience for them. The tribunes of South and West, of Farm and Factory, had their permanent base in Congress. The White House was simply a pleasant extra. Gore ran Wilson's campaign out of Chicago. When the Republican vote was split between Taft and Roosevelt, the truly eloquent, if not entirely sound of mind, Wilson was elected president. Bryan was made Secretary of State. Later, when it became clear that Wilson was maneuvering the United States into the First World War, Bryan honorably resigned. I've always thought him of far more consequence than historians now do. They remember his ignominious end at the monkey trial in Tennessee, not to mention the three defeats for president. In 1925, at the Scopes trial, Bryan and Darrow faced one another in a Tennessee village courtroom to argue about whether God created the world in a week or did life take a bit more time to evolve, as Darwin proposed. Bryan spoke for God and won. Darrow spoke for evolution and won because the educated minority of the country made a hero of him, and poor Brian, made to look ridiculous, promptly died. Some thought it was humiliation at being out-argued by a great lawyer. Dot knew better. Brian was killed by chicken and rice and gravy. How that man could eat, and in all that heat, too! Incidentally, a recent poll shows that only 9% of the American people believe in evolution we should be able to do marvelously well in the second millennium. But I think of him, like Gore in the early days, as a literally popular voice raised against the bold, crude ownership of the nation and a resolute enemy to the end, like Gore, of those wars that the ownership never ceases to wage against what it takes to be enemies of its financial system.
In the Senate, Gore was expected to forward Wilson's ambitious domestic program, which he did enthusiastically, even though the two had personally fallen out after the election, when the Senate was in the process of organizing itself. That is. Selecting various officers and setting up legislative procedures, the all-important post of secretary to the Senate had not yet been filled. Wilson sent for Gore on an urgent matter. I would like, said Wilson, for the Senate to appoint my brother Joseph secretary. He is highly qualified, and Gore listened, astonished. Finally. He said that he never thought he would have to remind so eminent a historian as the author of constitutional government in the United States that the legislative and executive branches of the government were forever equal and forever separate, and that for the executive to have his own brother as an executive spy in the councils of the legislature would make a perfect hash of the separation of powers. Wilson never forgave me for that. Does in his rocking chair, cracking peanuts, lap covered with their shells. The bushy white hair is in an interesting tangle. Of course, he was the sort of man who got uneasy if you ever raised your eyes higher than the third button on his waistcoat. As for me, the crooked smile. Well, whenever there's a Republican president, I'm a Democrat, and when there's a Democratic one, I'm out of step. He sounded more amused than sad. As a politician, he was a lone wolf. I suppose at heart he was more Whig than populist, and no conservative at all, at least in the current sense of the word. One who serves unquestioningly the wealthy interests that control American life, while parroting official cant of the better dead than red sort. He particularly loathed Franklin Roosevelt's phrase, "Age of the common man." There was never such an age, and never will be, and it goes beyond the limits of necessary demagoguery to pretend that there could even be such a thing. He also disliked Lincoln's rhetoric: "Was there ever a fraud greater than this government of, by, and for the people?" He threw back his head. The voice rose: "What people? Which people?" When he made that speech, almost half the American people had said that the government of the North was not of, by, or for them. So then Lincoln, after making a bloody war against the South, has the effrontery to say that this precious principle, which he would not extend to the Southern people, was the one for which the war had been fought. Well, he did say this at a graveyard for Northern soldiers. I suppose that was appropriate. Senator Gore was obliged to observe three American Caesars in action. In his youth, there was Theodore Roosevelt's Spanish-American War. Followed by the bloody conquest and subjugation of the Philippines, when Gore came to the Senate at thirty-seven, Roosevelt was still president and an anathema to a tribune of the farmers and workers. Then, twice, Gore helped elect Wilson president. From the start, there had been a vague understanding between them that the egregious Marshall be replaced as vice president in the second term by Gore, but as of nineteen sixteen. Relationships were so bad between Wilson and Gore that the senator decided to sit out the election. When it became obvious that Wilson was going to lose, Gore got a desperate call from the White House. The election would be determined by California. Gore was popular in California. Would he stump the state? Gore made one condition: the slogan must be "He kept us out of war," and presumably. He would do the same in the second term. Gore barnstormed California. Then he wired the White House the exact margin by which Wilson would carry the state. That night, Wilson's opponent, Charles Evans Hughes, went to bed as president of the United States. But the next morning, California was heard from, and Gore's predicted plurality reversed the election. Wilson was president, and the war came. If I got anything from Da, it was the ability to detect the false notes in those arias that our shepherds lull their sheep with. I always found him noblest when he put his career at risk for some overriding principle. He thought that no foreign war was worth the life of any American. Neither do I. 
When the Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce ordered him to vote for war in 1917, he wired them, How many of your members are of draft age? I had always thought Gore's concentration on one man's vanity too petty a motivation for the American role in the events of 1914 to 1917. But when I came to study Wilson at Versailles, blithely carving up the Austro-Hungarian Empire, I could understand why this ignorant would-be Metternich drove Dr. Freud so mad that he felt obliged to publish a libelous psychoanalysis of Wilson, without having met him, of course. Although Freud's analysis is nearly as demented as Wilson's imperial, even messianic behavior, he does echo Gore's original analysis of a prim American schoolteacher whose ignorant self-esteem never faltered. As I write, Wilson's handiwork is now exploding in what proved to be his dottiest invention, Yugoslavia. Because of T.P. Gore's anti-war and anti-League of Nations positions, the good people of Oklahoma had denied him a fourth term in the U.S. Senate, and so, from 1920 to 1930, he practiced law in Washington, D.C., and built his house. In the crash of 1929, Gore lost most of his money, but he was re-elected in 1930 on the same principles, he liked to say, that had defeated him a decade earlier. The comeback was a dim affair. I remember asking a political friend just before I entered the race, what was the mood of the people nowadays, and he said, they're a lot harder to tickle now. Predictably, he fell foul of the new president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. By then, Gore was a populist turned conservative. He and the president quarreled over whether or not the dollar should go off the gold standard. If you do, said Gore, you will have stolen the money of those who had faith in our currency. Carter Glass, a senator present at the meeting, later told the blind Gore that the president had gone gray in the face. But Roosevelt took the currency off gold. Later, of the half-dozen senators that Roosevelt tried to purge in 1936, T.P. Gore was the only one to lose his seat for good. I was ten when he was defeated. My stepfather sent him a thousand-dollar bill for his campaign. I had never seen a hundred-dollar bill, much less a thousand-dollar one. Even so, he lost the primary to a Roosevelt ally. He came home in the spring. He was melancholy, to say the least, and somewhat bored during the last thirteen years of his life, practicing law in Washington, mostly to get the government to pay the Indian tribes for those lands that it had stolen from them. I used to sit on the floor of the attic, reading newspaper cuttings from every period of his life. I recall a particularly savage attack on him in 1930, mocking his hoary jokes, along with a photograph of the Rock Creek Park house, supposedly built with the tainted oil money of one Doheny. Out of office, Gore had written a legal brief for the oil man, when Doheny went to prison for the Teapot Dome oil field scandal, my father took Gore, very nervous indeed, to the prison cell. Why they met, I don't know. But the fact that he had been briefly, while out of office, a lawyer to the master of corruption earned T.P. Gore the sobriquet Teapot Gore. Such is the nature of reputation— the religious man is known to be an atheist. The generous man is called mean. Some years ago, an actress told me that everyone knew that Noel Coward liked to eat shit. I was horrified. I knew Coward well. He was as fastidious about sex as everything else. When I saw her recently, she said, I've never forgotten what you told me about Noel Coward, that he liked to eat shit. Thus I have been transformed into the source of a truly sick invention that will be grist to the satanic mills of Capotes as yet unborn. Courage was Gore's most notable trait, but then his great-grandfather had been a Methodist preacher of such somber fire and will that he was known as Rock Gore. On the demerit side, Da did not think that government money should go to anybody if he could help it. When I first came to the Senate, there were still pensioned widows from the War of 1812. Give someone a pension and you create a Methuselah. 
Coldly, he refused the request of a delegation of the blind for government aid. He had been able to make his way, he told them, and so could they. This was disingenuous. When I was young, cheese and crackers was one word to me, he used to say, emphasizing his poverty. Bored with this repetition, I am said to have responded, at the age of six or so, well, ice cream and cake are one word to me. Da's socialist impulses eroded with time. He had wanted to nationalize the railroads when he helped write the Constitution of the State of Oklahoma, and I believe that this virtuous proposal is still in the text. But despite his expertise on banking and currency in the Senate, he detested Maynard Keynes without quite understanding him. He grasped, reluctantly, tax and spend in bad economic times, but he never took in the other side to Keynesianism. Try to make money in good times and in the classic marketplace. Da deeply dislikes Roosevelt, both personally and politically. He worships at the shrine of power and popularity. There is now, he notes, almost $50 billion of national debt, hardly a Star Wars price tag for what was meant to be a new deal for those millions of people undone by a vast depression. The worst hit, as Da had prophesied, were the veterans of that war for Wilson's greater personal glory. It is a pity that so little is understood today about American isolationism. It is accepted that hyphenate Americans, newly arrived from suicidal old Europe, would not want to go back to the continent they had so recently fled to fight for their new rulers' investments. But less understood is how old Americans clung so tenaciously to the Washingtonian precept that nations have interests, not friends or enemies, and that wars far from home will, in time, erode the state. Finally, rather more mystically, there was the idea of American exceptionalism. We were intended to be like no other country. We were neo-noble savages. More to the point, we had territories so vast that without immigration we could never have filled them up with the descendants of the three million residents of the Republic of 1789. So much did we want to keep ourselves to ourselves that John Quincy Adams, as Secretary of State to James Monroe, invented the Monroe Doctrine, denying any European power a foothold anywhere in our hemisphere while swearing a great oath that we would never meddle in European politics, much less wars. Wilson abrogated that doctrine in 1917. Of course, from the beginning, we were twice cursed in our Garden of Eden, first with the peculiar institution of slavery, then with the systematic dispossession of the original Mongol population, known fancifully as Indians. Ironically, after the Gores had become prosperous in northern Mississippi during the 1840s by taking over what had been Chickasaw land, T.P. Gore went west to the territories to which the Chickasaws had been removed, and, in effect, by creating Oklahoma, he helped rob them of their land a second time. Also, ironically, guiltily, he tended to take the side of the Indians in their losing disputes with the government over the stolen lands. From 1936 to 1949, he worked as an attorney for the Apache, Comanche, and Kiowa tribes— and some years after his death, they finally won a judgment against the federal government. The spirit of Harry of the West, as Henry Clay was known, was the spirit of the border people from Clay to Lincoln to Gore. Internal improvements were what interested these rustic paladins. When imperialistic President Polk gave us the Mexican War, which in turn gave us what is now one-third of the United States, including California— Congressman Lincoln denounced him, Lieutenant U.S. Grant did too, on the ground that we were behaving like a predatory European power. We were supposed to create our unique Arcadia without border raids on other countries. We certainly needed no more land. Wasn't the Monroe Doctrine our holy text? Along with the Declaration of Independence, which proclaimed as a universal human given the right not only to pursue happiness, but the implicit right to separate from an onerous foreign master? Gore came out of the border world. 
He represented the ruined farmers of the Civil War who would later be victimized by Eastern financiers playing casino with the price of cotton. Seven-cent cotton was one of the first phrases I can remember hearing. In due course, Bryan and Gore and the other liberals, today called conservatives or nativists or worse, reached out to labor, organized or not. Hence, Gore's mysterious appearance in Darrow's courtroom, where union labor was on trial. The civil war that had brought ruin to the South had also awakened all sorts of energies that led to new alliances. In effect, the Party of the People took over the Democratic Party, and despite the presence of the big city bosses, who at least represented the working man, unionized or not, the party was for the working people at large in a way that the Republicans could not be, since they tended to agree with Alexander Hamilton that the rich were wiser and better than the poor, and so ought to be allowed to rule the country and do business without popular interference. Conflicts between the two sides continue to this day. But for Gore and the other populists, the imperialism of the two Roosevelts and Woodrow Wilson, Polk too, earlier, was a terrible distraction from our destiny, which was the perfection of our own unusual, if not, in the end, particularly exceptional society. Da turns on the radio news. He prefers right-wing commentators like Fulton Lewis, Jr., he did not live long enough to realize just how conservative a President Roosevelt was at home or how much a radical imperialist he was abroad, breaking up the colonial empires of our allies as well as those of our enemies, and, like metal filings to a magnet, attracting their fragments to us. All that Gore can see in the vast amount of debt, so puny compared to what the truly radical Reagan was to give us. These debts constitute a first lien, a first mortgage on every dollar's worth of private property. However, all this is not the most fatal defect in the New Deal. It has spoiled the character and the morals, spoiled the souls of millions of our people. I have always thought that self-respect is the sheer anchor of human character. As long as it holds, there is hope. When it breaks, there is no hope. There is nothing left. Thus speaks the Protestant conscience, not to mention, alas, Herbert Hoover. I have always regarded Roosevelt's improvisations in a kindlier light. It was the depression brought on by the higher capitalism that denied people work, and Roosevelt was there, no matter how opportunistically, to get the people, as well as the capitalists, through bad times. But there is indeed a terrible truth in Gore's observations on the necessity of self-respect, of individual autonomy. In order to exclude the black minority from American society, the white majority decided to pay them off with welfare, thus seeing to it that there would be no anchor for many black families for many generations. No wonder so many are now choosing the fire this time as the ultimate self-respect. Anyway, I thought Billy and Bobby Mock were cute as a pair of bug's ears, and I wished I were either one of them. One of them, mind you. I certainly did not want to be two of me, as one seemed more than enough to go around, even in so exaggerated a family. When I watched The Prince and the Pauper the first time, I wanted to be not one, but two— Lonely children often have imaginary playmates, but I was never lonely. I was solitary and wanted no company at all other than books and movies and my own imagination. A childhood desire to be a twin does not seem to me to be narcissistic in the vulgar Freudian sense. After all, one is oneself, and the other, other. It is the sort of likeness that makes for wholeness— and is it not that search for likeness, that desire and pursuit of the whole, as Plato has Aristophanes' remark, that is the basis of all love? As no one has ever actually found perfect wholeness in another human being, no matter of what sex, the twin is the closest that one can ever come toward human wholeness with another. 
and, dare one invoke biology and the origin of our species, back of us mammals doomed to die once we have procreated, there is always our sexless ancestor, the amoeba, which never dies as it does not reproduce sexually, but merely, serenely, breaks in two and identically replicates. Yet doubleness has always fascinated me, as mirrors do, as filmed images do. I have read that a recurring theme in my work is doubleness or duplicity. If this is the case, I see now where it might have, unconsciously at least, begun. In any case, it was after I saw the film that I saw my other half in Jimmy Trimble. It was thought best by Nina that I board during the week at St. Albans, an all-boys school near Washington's Cathedral. I was allowed to come home on weekends. At midterm, Jimmy became a boarder. We were friends immediately. I was one week older than he. We were the same height and weight. He had pale blue eyes. Mine were pale brown. He had the hunter-athlete's farsightedness. I had the writer-reader's myopic vision. I was blonde with straight hair. He was blonde with curly hair. His sweat smelled of honey, like that of Alexander the Great. I had a very nice dog, Jimmy had reported, a toy Scotty named Wiggles. But my mother would not let the dog in the house, so while I was away during the week at boarding school, a thirty-minute drive from Marywood, Wiggles was exiled to a fenced-in area beside the garage, itself set over a squash court, where Hudy never played, but Jimmy and I used to roller skate, ruining the wood floor. The dog was one of a thousand sore points between Nina and me. My father had brought me the puppy, a present from Liz Whitney, whose numerous dogs roamed her 18th-century Virginia house, Langolan. Litters were constantly being produced beneath Chippendale consoles and allowed to grow up on the spot. I often wished that Liz were my mother. Nina promptly took the dog and said that Liz had given it to her. This was followed by a flaming row of the sort that punctuated her life with me and, indeed, with anyone that she knew well. In later, more reflective years, she blamed her behavior on an agonizing menopause. But as of 1935, she was all set to have two more children, ladled into her by Silver Spoon. So she was also obliged to note, for those who might be counting, that her periods had also been more excruciating than those of any other woman in medical history. At the beginning, Wiggles had slept in Nina's Art Deco bedroom. A fashionable word in those days was neurasthenic which could mean practically anything. In Nina's case, it meant fearful hangovers combined with a morphine habit. Once or twice a week, one Dr. Huffman, wearing a Prince Albert, would arrive to administer a shot. Then, if the company was not too grand, he would be asked for lunch. I am upper middle class, the drunken Auden kept repeating at our last meeting. My father was a doctor to which I finally replied, well, he would never have made the grade in my day, in my city. But with or without the humble Dr. Huffman's drugs, the sound of the dog's claws at night on the bedroom floor gave Nina the jitters, and so Wiggles was banished from the house. On those weekends that I was allowed to come home, usually when Mr. and Mrs. Auchincloss were on safari in Hobe Sound, or places even more dangerous and farther to the south, Jimmy and I would join Wiggles in the enclosure and tell her how sorry we were about her exile. Jimmy's mother had been much struck by details of life in the great house. They also have silk sheets, and the butler asks you at night what you want for breakfast. I tried to recall, as I looked into what proved to be Jimmy's eyes across the table from me, what it was that we had talked about when alone together. He was an athlete. I played nothing except erratic tennis. I read everything that I could. He read as little as possible. I remember him mostly in flashes. I'd go with him to hear Benny Goodman at the Capitol Theater. He loved jazz, swing, played saxophone. I liked classical music, played nothing. 
What we had entirely in common, aside from each other, was the fact that each was already what he would be when grown up. He was professional athlete. I was writer. That was that. Neither was uncertain about what to do in the future because each was already doing it. This completeness set us off from our contemporaries. As a result, neither was much of a success as a schoolboy. Little of what we were offered in class was of the slightest use to either him or to me. I was thought to be reasonably intelligent by the various schools that I attended. Certainly, I was often more widely, if eccentrically, read than many of my teachers, which was not saying much. Unfortunately for me, and irritatingly for them, I have never been so bored, before or since, as I was by the courses that I was obliged to take and pass. For an energetic mind, with a passion to know everything, to be confined to translating from the Latin that dismal miniaturist Cornelius Nepos was exquisite torture, particularly when I was being denied, at least in class, Suetonius. Juvenal, Tacitus, and Livy, whom I had read at seven in English. Worse, what passed for education in those days involved the memorizing of everything, from Latin subjunctive verbs to mathematical theorems. Outside reading was not encouraged, neither was thought. I wanted to know far more history and literature than any school would ever have taught, while all he needed was a playing field to dominate. So, haphazardly, I educated myself, all the while resentful of the dullness and the irrelevance of the classroom. Since learning, then, was mostly by rote, I developed a block against memorizing so great that now, when I occasionally act in films, dialogue must be glued to the backs of chairs or written on cards held out of camera range. Today, schools, for the rich, that is, there is nothing much for the rest, know better how to teach. Their only problem is what to teach. The differences between Jimmy and me were sometimes polar. I detested my mother. He adored his. I said as much to Mrs. Sewell. She smiled. I remember when he was first brought to me at the hospital. I had so much wanted a brunette, and there he was, all blonde already. I must admit I was a little disappointed to have two blondes, Jimmy and his sister. Before my children were born, I took a course in nutrition. I always made the bread and just about everything else from scratch. Did they like it? I never gave them any choice. She was serene. I wondered if her diet explained Jimmy's odorless sweat. Yet too little is made of the importance of human odor when it comes to sexual attraction. But then... Is it the smell of a particular person whom we already like that attracts us? Or does a liking for a certain smell draw us, be to flower's pistol, to its owner? Jimmy overflowed with animal energy, not to mention magnetism for both sexes. Even so, at twelve or thirteen, together from the ledge, we watched Roosevelt's second inaugural parade in which Jean took no part since he was resigning his post. I was delighted to be able to report to him that I had had sex, if that is quite the phrase, with a girl before Jimmy did. He was riveted, wanted details. The event had taken place in the game room at Marywood, an airless chamber in the cellar where game was hung and aged, game never shot by Hudi, but often sent him by friends. I was showing a girl that I'd known for some time this scary room, scary because on the inside of the heavy metal door there was a rusty round knob that one had to push in order to open the door. If it failed to work, you would suffocate, unheard by anyone, since the room was soundproofed. On the floor, the girl and I fumbled about, and I was almost as interested in what I was going to tell Jimmy about the great mystery that I had at least barely penetrated as I was in the earth-shaking event itself. Rousseau thought that Montaigne should have told us more about his sex life. I think Montaigne told quite enough. But then I have never had much interest in the sexual lives of real people, I suspect that I was the only boy of that era to have read Frank Harris, skipping the sex parts in order to get to the political and literary anecdotes. I do like pornography, 
but only when it is clearly fiction. Boarders in the lower school were divided between the aristocrats, who had pubic hair, and the plebes, who did not. I was part of the aristocracy. When Jimmy arrived at midterm, he was much discussed. Did he or didn't he have pubic hair? He went for a shower, and I joined him, aristocratic, with bright gold curls. As I looked at him, he gave me a big grin, and so it began. Likeness drawn to likeness, soon to be made whole by desire, minus the obligatory pursuit. When I came to read the symposium, I was amazed at how precisely Plato had anticipated two boys twenty-three hundred years later. The classic scholar M. I. Finlay once told me that it was not he but one of his students who first noticed that Plato never speaks in his own voice at that famous dinner party. Rather, he gives to others viewpoints that he may or may not have shared. So it is Aristophanes, not Plato, who explains to his dinner companions the nature of sexual desire. To begin with, there were three sexes, each shaped like a globe: male, female, hermaphrodite. The three globes behaved offensively to the king of the gods, who chose to discipline them by slicing each in half, just as you or I might chop up sour apples for pickling. Remarks Aristophanes, or slice an egg with a hair. Apollo was then called in to tidy up the six creatures that had once been three. Now, when the work of bisection was complete, it left each half with a desperate yearning for the other, and they ran together and flung their arms around each other's necks and asked for nothing better than to be rolled into one. This explains, according to Aristophanes, how the male half of the hermaphrodite is attracted to his female half, while the half of the woman sphere is drawn to woman and man to man. And so, when this boy lover, or any lover for that matter, is fortunate enough to meet his other half, they are both so intoxicated with affection, with friendship, and with love that they cannot bear to let each other out of sight for a single instant, although they may be hard put to say what they really want with one another. And indeed, the purely sexual pleasure of their friendship could hardly account for the huge delight they take in one another's company. The fact is that both their souls are longing for something else, a something to which they can neither of them put a name, and so all this to do is a relic of that original state of ours when we were whole. Parenthetically, I have just been reading Kenneth Dover's wonderfully self-confident memoirs. The author of Greek Homosexuality asks. Why did Plato make Aristophanes the mouthpiece of the other half doctrine? My own answer was and is that Plato recognizes it as a vulgar, uneducated idea, and therefore appropriate to a writer of comedies which are undeniably vulgar and populist. Dover then celebrates those of us who are happily married. One is pleased, of course, for the Dovers. Even so, there are other equally successful unions. But I am hardly disinterested, as I too have written vulgar and populist comedies. I cannot think just how or why my coming together with Jimmy happened to take place on the white tile floor of the bathroom at Marywood. I suppose that the butler was on the prowl at the time, but there we were, belly to belly, in the act of becoming one. As it turned out, Jimmy had been involved with another boy, while I. Despite wet dreams, had never even masturbated. As it was, mutual masturbation was impossible with Jimmy, too painful for me because his large calloused hands gripped a cock like a baseball bat. So we simply came together, reconstituting the original male that Zeus had split in two. Yet sexual pleasure could hardly account for the huge delight we took in one another's company. There was no guilt. No sense of taboo, but then we were in Arcadia, not diabolic Eden. At first, teachers used to ask me why I wasn't a football player like my father. 
Interestingly enough, Jean himself was fascinated by my erudition, as he called it in a letter to me, and had not the slightest interest in my being an athlete. One reason I didn't like football was the boredom of putting on and taking off all that gear. Even so, at an early school, I made what I thought was an unusually brilliant touchdown against what proved to be, upon closer analysis, my own team. Metaphorically, that said it all. Let coaches bark like dogs. My caravan was moving on, like a juggernaut. I still recall a baseball game at St. Albans. As I looked at the unfinished tower of the cathedral in the distance, I wondered, close to despair, if I would ever be delivered from this state of perfect boredom. As one means of escape, I had developed a vivid inner life, with a number of fictional narratives going on in my head at any one time. At bad moments, I would simply switch on a story and be gone. This trick of improvising stories for myself continued until I was out of the army and into the world, where life's narrative took over. Luckily, I never lost the knack of being able to switch on, pretty much at will, a fictional narrative. This proved to be a lifesaver when, broke in my twenties, I was obliged to write five pseudonymous books in less than two years. Although I am told that I have an eidetic imagination, I can summon up vivid scenes, recalled or invented, in my head, I have no idea how or why I do this. Now, despite my aversion to Freud, I find a most odd explanation of this by Georges Simoneau, author of hundreds of novels and copulator of thousands of women. From the example of Balzac, I wish to show that a novelist's work is not an occupation like another. It implies renunciation. It is a vocation, if not a curse or a disease. It is sometimes said that a typical novelist is a man who was deprived of motherly love. The fact is that the need to create other people the compulsion to draw out of oneself a crowd of different characters could hardly arise in a man who is otherwise happy and harmoniously adjusted to his own little world. Why should he so obstinately attempt to live other people's lives if he himself were secure and without revolt? Lack of well-roundedness did not affect my relations with the other boys at St. Albans, who, mysteriously and easily, accepted my preference for books to their games. In this, they were more tolerant of my eccentricity than some of the masters. The head of the lower school, now in his nineties, as I write, still remarks with wonder, the other boys took it for granted that Gore wasn't going to play games, and they didn't mind. He did not go so far as to say that I was popular, but he realized that I had, somehow, decided not to conform, and that I had, somehow, got away with it. I'd learned, very early, how to transmit, in an interesting way, sufficient knowledge and imagination to charm those that I wanted to charm. Also, I was physically well-developed for my age and managed to win or neutralize the inevitable fights that stand out like bonfires in the pages of those memoirists who begin life as shy, misunderstood youths. I was never shy, and if I was misunderstood, it was because I was modeling myself on that preteen actor Mickey Rooney, and so played many parts, including my favorite, that of Paramount Leader. Wherever I was... I always formed a gang, and I was boss. At friend school, the gang's headquarters was a collapsed frame building in the center of a large meadow. We had all been warned not to go inside the ruin, a haphazard pile of lumber with many intricate passageways and dead ends, a maze of delight where we would hide out, preparing for wars with other gangs. At Marywood, I was cut off pretty much from the Gores, and, finally, from Marywood itself when I was sent as boarder to St. Albans. A good thing, as it turned out, because I finally began to make friends. Once I was in the dormitory, there was Jimmy, and the first human happiness that I had ever encountered— I do not strike the note of self-pity, because, never having experienced happiness before, 
as opposed to my own odd constitutional cheerfulness, I could hardly have pitied myself for what I'd not experienced. I had always known how to make people laugh, and, once free of raging Nina and sad Hudi, I also laughed a lot. Yet, to be fair, in passing, Hudi was most generous to me. He gave me castles and toy soldiers, and at Marywood I would deploy them by the hour, inventing stories for them, mostly non-martial. The life of the imagination became more and more intense as the reality about me became more unendurable. At eleven I started, mysteriously, vomiting in Nina's presence. Words were suddenly failing me. Of the masters at St. Albans, Stanley Sofield was my favorite. He was a plump young man with thick brown hair, glasses, a taper's nose, and small chin. Musical comedy mad, he wrote and produced shows of his own making at a summer camp. He drank a good deal, which meant that the class that Jimmy and I had with him, early in the morning, often found us face to face with Stanley in a state of terminal hangover. We could always tell if it was one of those days by his gentle, grave manner, his slightly pained squint, and the very, very soft voice that he used when he told us to pipe down as we took our seats. Then, like a sleepwalker, he would go through the lesson of the day, often at the blackboard. The tone was always one of gentle, expository reason, but we all knew that a storm was now on its way. He was like a benign Nina. One could never guess what would trigger Stanley. Two boys talking in the back or an unusual display of ignorance could set off the scream. Now, the scream was no ordinary human scream. It was a cry from another species or world. An H.P. Lovecraft ghoul's eldritch howl or the blast Tarzan's Tantor the Elephant made. The entire lower school would fall silent as that scream slowly rose to a crescendo, while the blood of even the best and the brightest turned to ice. Then books would begin to fly with devastating accuracy across the room, each finding, like a proto-smart bomb, an offending boy. We were ecstatic with terror. This was life. Emotion writ large. Catharsis. Then the voice would return to its normal hangover level, and class would continue. Stanley had nicknames for boys he liked. I was still called Jean. At fourteen, I lopped off my Christian name and became Gore. So for Stanley, I was Jean E. with the light brown hair, always sung while I writhed with embarrassment. Jimmy was also a favorite, though I forget his nickname. If not seated together in class, Jimmy and I would signal each other when a hard-on had arrived, unbidden. When the other boys figured out what we were doing, they began signaling too. At twelve, erections come and go, like T.S. Eliot's ladies, talking, most appropriately, of Michelangelo. The highlight of my school days was the summer of 1939, the war was almost upon us, but Stanley and another master were hell-bent on getting to Europe for one last look. They cooked up a plan to take a half-dozen of the boys to France to perfect our French and go sightseeing. Nina was immediately sold on the plan. I was getting a bit too old to be shipped off, yet again, to Camp William Lawrence in New Hampshire, to be with the other boys and become well-rounded, and as far from Marywood and Newport as possible. For the next to last time, Jimmy and I made love in the woods above the Roaring River. I remember his almost mature body with the squared bony shoulders and rosy skin against bright green he was already becoming famous in Washington as a baseball player, and I was busy writing and thinking of a political career. At thirteen, we talked about girls less than we did about each other. This was a sign, though I was hardly adept at signs then. Why should anyone happy ever note a sign? After sex, we swam against the swift, deadly current of the forbidden Potomac River, swam among rocks and driftwood to a special large, gray-brown, glacial rock where we lay, side by side. We're going to go on doing this for the rest of our lives, I remember thinking, 
tempting, no, driving, fate to break us in two. If I had been told that we'd meet only one more time in his short life, I would have done what I have done, no doubt. Happily, neither of us knew the future. I did know that after Europe, Nina intended to ship me off to schools far away while Jimmy would stay on at St. Albans, where I wanted to stay, but alas, the school was far too close to Nina's more and more scandalous field of operations. Every now and then, in idle moments, I start to hear snatches of the conversation of those two boys on the rock that afternoon. Could play ball as a pro. Can't be a politician without a state, and I don't come from anywhere. Maybe Virginia. Lyrics of some jazz song sung in Jimmy's light tenor. Gotta learn sax. Writing a novel, trying to... I'm going to, maybe to VPI, but they don't have much of a ball team. Hate her. Who said that? I'm now projecting present feelings upon a cloudless sunny day when Europe was ahead of me and all I cared for beside me. In later years, whenever I tried out a play at the National Theater in Washington, I'd ask Stanley to come backstage when I gave notes after a performance. Then we'd go out on the town and drink. He was thrilled by backstage life, and I was always delighted to be with my one last link to St. Albans, to our European summer. To Jimmy. Jimmy, Stanley smiles. I went on seeing him all along until he left for the Marines. Stanley was closeted, as they say in gay circles, but I don't know to what degree he was suppressed. Once grown, I was always candid with him, but he was not with me, as was proper. I put the question, did Jimmy ever talk about me? Stanley, now very stout, looks at me slightly glassy-eyed, more from drink than from sadness at all that was lost. Oh, yes. He knew you and I were in touch from time to time. A white lie of great kindness. Suddenly, his eyes focus. Yes, I do remember one day when you were already in the army and he was about to go off to the Marines, and the two of us drove by Marywood and he said he wanted to stop and look around, and so we did. We didn't go near the house, of course, only to the tennis court where the two of you used to play. Stanley frowns. I don't know, he begins and stops. Then, he seems sad. Did you know why? I do now, don't I? Europe. With Stanley and young Hamilton Fish, now old and just retired from Congress, and a number of other boys, as well as a teacher called Barlow and his wife, we set out in June aboard the Ile de France, second or third class. Pomfrites, Grenadine, summer school at Jouy en Josa, classes in a manor house with domed drawing room, French lessons, walks into Versailles, Baba Orum. Paris, July 14th. I stand on the steps of the Grand Palais as the French army parades. Nervous, bald man in an open car at the center of all this glory. Premier de Ladier, the Bull of Vaucluse, soon to be a prisoner of the Nazis. In buses, we toured First World War battlefields, poppies nicely symbolic of blood already shed and of blood to be shed yet again in a year's time. Maginot line, cement bunkers, impregnable, so impregnable that the Germans sensibly went around the line. In the bus I fell in love with an older woman, Hammy Fish's sister, Ziva, perhaps sixteen. Never saw her again, though I've seen him. He succeeded to his isolationist father's seat in the congressional district where I'd been a candidate before him. At Orléans, an old lady squatted down under a tree near the cathedral and relieved herself. I talked to a soldier. He gave me his name, Louis Gillet, and army address. I wrote him twice from school, sent him a dollar bill. He thanked me warmly. Nothing more. Rome. August. Heat. I did not careen and moan from monument to monument like Henry James, but I knew that I was home. Forum full of broken marble. I picked up a head and hid it under my coat. Stanley saw me and made me put it back. 
Black shirts everywhere. The crowds, like those of France, smelled of garlic. Ten years later, no whiff of garlic in either country. Prosperity. Baths of Caracalla. The opera Turandot. We sit outside in a railed-off box under the hot, dark sky. In the next box, Mussolini, wearing a white uniform. At the first interval, he rose and saluted the soprano. Audience cheered. Then he left the box. As he passed me, I smelled heavy cologne. On stage, he saluted the audience, fascist arm outstretched. Vanished. Since we were official children, Hammy's father was chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Ambassador Phillips received us in the old embassy. Tall glasses of orange juice and a large, plain girl, daughter of Postmaster General Farley. What a good time the ambassador must have had that day, I wrote of Phillips years later in Hollywood. End of August, war about to begin. We take the last train out of Italy before the border with France is shut. A dash across France and the Channel to London, Bloomsbury, Russell Square, old boarding house, fascinating primitive bathroom. September 1st, we are in Downing Street to watch the Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, leave to go to Westminster to say that war is now at hand. Thin little man, a wing collar, huge Adam's apple, uncommonly small head. No cheers, no jeers. The crowd simply sighs in unison on exhalation. Terrible, mournful sound. Chamberlain tries to smile, winces instead, is driven off. At Liverpool, we board the Antonia for New York. In the Irish Sea, we see our sister ship, Athenia, torpedoed by a Nazi sub. Longboats carrying passengers to the dull, misty green Irish shore. Consternation aboard our ship. Some wanted to turn back. Captain did not. We zigzagged across the North Atlantic. Canteen ran out of chocolate. No other hardship. I did not know fear because I knew that true history, life and death too, only existed in books, and this wasn't a book that I'd read, just a gray ship in a dark sea. Genie with the light brown hair, sang Mr. Sofield. Shut up, sir, said Genie. The fact that eight years between my tenth and seventeenth years were spent far from home at boys' schools was, in one sense, a good thing. I did not have to deal with Nina. But it was a bad thing in that those webs of friendships that start at an early age between boys and boys and then between boys and girls were broken beyond repair. The upper-class youth of small-town Washington were sent to one of two dancing classes, Mrs. Shippen's or Miss Hawks's. Boys and girls were taught not only to dance, but to deport themselves in such a way that in due course they would either marry someone from the dancing class or someone very like someone from the dancing class and settle down to a decorous life. After St. Albans and Mrs. Shippen's dancing class, I made no friends until I was grown. The principal annoyance of living at Marywood was that I had little opportunity to go home to my grandparents' house in Rock Creek Park. Occasionally, the Gores came to Marywood. That seems to have been part of the contract between Senator, Mad Hudy, and Nina, but such occasions usually ended badly when Nina would quarrel with her mother. One Christmas day, Nina gave Dot a fur coat. Then, after Nina had said or done something peculiarly offensive, Dot threw the fur coat at her and went home. Meanwhile, every attempt to well-round me failed. I was given a Winchester rifle that I never touched. Paradoxically, I later liked the carbine that the Army issued me. I disliked team sports and managed to avoid them almost entirely at St. Albans, to the bemusement of the masters. Then I was sent off to Los Alamos, a ranch school, where some seventy allegedly disturbed, allegedly rich boys each had a horse. The school's founder, A.J. Connell, was a disciple of Theodore Roosevelt's strenuous life. 
He was also a pederast who insisted on weekly physical exams for the boys, disturbing, no doubt, even the disturbed, amongst whom, a decade earlier, there had been the disturbed and disturbing William S. Burroughs of the adding machine family. Fortunately, wherever I was, even Los Alamos, the library was my center. At fourteen, I wanted to know the entire history of the entire world. Although reading was discouraged at Los Alamos in the interest of strenuousness, I not only managed to read nearly all of Shakespeare, but I made a solid dent in a vast series devoted to the history of Europe, country by country, beginning with Guizot's France. I now understand why my mother, only marginally literate, would find so ravenous an intellectual curiosity distasteful, suspecting, correctly, that it would lead to what every teacher regards as the worst perversion of all, autodidacticism. I did like the fact that, after claustrophobic Los Alamos, Exeter was a large place where you could pursue your own interests. It was also reassuringly brutal, just like the real world, or so they rather smugly assured us. But, in retrospect, the real world, at least for me, turned out to be far pleasanter and easier to handle than dour Exeter. The American hysteria about homosexuality was so extreme in those days that friendships between boys were deliberately discouraged, a cruel and counterproductive thing to do in an all-male environment. Duly intimidated, we became coldly competitive and expert at the art of the cruel put-down, I came out like a flower and was cut down, our poet Lou Sibley used to quote as he prepared yet another epitaph for one of us. I fear that I was also good at this sort of thing. The only amicable relations that I had at Exeter were with three teachers, T. Riggs, H. Phillips, and L. Stevens. One could at least talk to them without fear of intellectual ambush. One of the few boys that I found congenial was Bob Bingham. He was tall and sturdy, with a booming voice. Flamingo was a song that he often thundered. We double-dated at the girls' school, Wellesley, and one night slept out on a golf course. He was the editor of the school literary magazine, The Review. I was on the board. One would think that with so much in common, the relationship would have been easy. Instead... It was edgy. So competitive was the atmosphere that he and I were soon in a struggle over which of us was going to be the writer. He was indolent. I was not. I had begun to write a florid novel, never happily finished, but I did turn out dozens of short stories. If Hemingway was correct, he was not, that celibacy increases and improves a writer's output, I was positively Shakespearean, at least in output. There was also no sex for me at the school, or for much of anyone else. On the rare occasions when sex was a possibility, he who made the first move would be forever in the power of the moved upon, no matter what happened. This made for a certain guarded irritability in all relations. Later, I was told that the boys, as we called the athletes, were somewhat freer with each other. One, a lanky baseball pitcher, baseball yet again, swung his leg against mine in English class. I gave him a startled look. He grinned. I suspected a trap and pulled away. Although there were four other editors at The Review, Bob exercised a power of veto. After I had published one story, he exercised his veto vigorously in my case. He had the head of a huge cherub with blue eyes that would suddenly fill with tears if he was thwarted or in any way put down. When I denounced him for keeping me out of the magazine and himself altogether too visibly in, tears filled those innocent blue eyes. How can you say that? I mean, well... It's only your story I'm rejecting, because it's not as good as you can do. Since stories were often sent us for submission, I wrote a comic piece to which I signed the name of a boy none of us knew. I presented it to the editors. I got this yesterday. I think it's pretty funny. Bob read the story aloud and laughed the loudest. 
the story was unanimously accepted. It was a lovely victory. Bob never forgave me for what he called my duplicity. In later life, when the New York Times refused for more than a decade to review me in its daily paper, and always badly in the Sunday supplement, I recalled Exeter and published three novels as Edgar Box. Each was extravagantly praised by the Times. Plainly, Exeter, though a bad place for the kinder emotions, proved to be a good training ground for every kind of warfare. When Bob became editor of The Reporter, he got me to be, briefly, drama critic. Then he vanished into The New Yorker magazine as an editor, and a very good one, I am told. He did write one novel after the war. It was not published. He once told an interviewer that he would rather be a good editor than a bad novelist. This was meant to be the ultimate put-down. But I thought that it was not quite up to our old savage standards. Like several of our contemporaries who had seen heavy combat in the infantry, Bingham came back from the war with, how to describe it, a broken ego? For him, some sense of self was lost for good in France. I think it was Bingham who had the happy notion to break into the files of the English department and find out what the various teachers had said about us as we moved from the class of one to that of another. A master complained that I seldom did the required reading, but would often be found reading irrelevant books on history or novels not on the syllabus, like Man's The Magic Mountain. Another wrote that, as a writer and a speaker, I was a soapbox orator. This was at the height of the struggle between the America Firsters, of which I was one of the student leaders, and the Interventionists, which included most of the Anglophile faculty. Of the teachers, only Tom Riggs was on my side. A radical young man, he had, while at Princeton, organized the Veterans of Future Wars. This caused a national stir, particularly when he demanded that we be given our bonuses now, before the war and possible death. Riggs and I used to think of ways of discomforting the interventionists, headed by a boy called Gunner, whom I dubbed Give Him a Gun Gunner. One prescient English teacher wrote that I might well be a credit to the school if we can stand him for another two years. Another teacher, after a class with me, told his colleagues, I wish that I were a bull. When asked why, he said, So that I could gore Vidal. Well, I see their point, but I don't think that they ever saw mine. As most of them were dim dispensers of conventional wisdom, I felt, who knows why, an obligation to find out what they really meant, particularly when they got onto politics, and then to contradict them, an unpopular trait that I shared with Mary McCarthy, who once told me, I was always the one in class to hold up my hand to say no to the teacher. I couldn't stop myself. Unsuccessful as a child, I was proving to be a perfect failure at pretending to be a conventional adolescent in a New England boys' school. Then, three years after graduation, I published my first novel. I am told that there was rage and despair in the English department. Only the best teacher that I had, Leonard Stevens, was pleased by what I had done, but in his gentle way he suggested I try to transcend the national manner, gray, literal, realistic prose, and read more Henry James. I did. And I did. In the class behind me was John Knowles, whom I don't remember, but he remembers me because, I suppose, I was conspicuous at the debating societies as well as in the wars on behalf of America First. We have been friends many years now, and I admire the novel that he based on our school days, A Separate Piece. I am the character Brinker, Jack tells me, and soon the world, since he is currently writing a book on the novel and its background. I don't see the slightest resemblance. True, Brinker is the class politician, but in the story he acts as a sort of snooping district attorney, trying to find out whether or not one boy caused another boy to fall from a tree. I've told Jack that since I had almost no interest in any of my classmates, I would be the last person to mix myself in the business of others. 
My time was spent writing and reading and counting the days to my deliverance, not only from the school and later the army, but from the control of others. Nevertheless, a separate piece remains an eerily precise reconstruction of how things were in that long-ago world before the Second War. In my sixteenth summer, I went to work in Jean's factory in Camden, New Jersey. In the interest of finding a cheap fuselage for his Fliver aircraft, metal was too expensive, he had developed something called Vidal Weldwood, a laminated plywood that proved to be useful for making, among other things, wingtips for fighter planes, which the Vidal company manufactured. The war was well underway in the summer of 1942. I lived in a boarding house and worked as unskilled labor. I ate my first cheeseburger, a new invention, I think. I also bought a package of camel cigarettes and tried to learn to smoke, but after a few attempts, I gave up. Factory work was as dull as I'd suspected. The only person at home on the floor was a mad Englishman who, in response to the rubber shortage, was busy inventing a molded plywood automobile tire. With each awful failure, his confidence grew. In the middle of the summer, Jean suffered a coronary thrombosis and was not expected to live long. I saw him in St. Luke's Hospital, New York eyes a glazed yellow-gray from drugs, the hair on his chest gone as gray as mine is now. Haltingly, he told me to work hard. Neither of us had the right script for this scene. As it was, thanks to his years as an athlete, he had developed powerful ancillary veins to the heart and recovered. But in those days, heart attack survivors were kept immobile for at least a year after the attack, thus truly ruining their health. He was never the same again. Jean was not interested in business once the initial invention or organization had been completed. Even before the heart attack, he had begun to drift away from his companies to the consternation of his partners, the Pugh family of Philadelphia, owners of Sun Oil. Three years later, when I was in the army, Jean wrote me to say that he was playing tennis again. I am so healthy I don't know what to do with myself now that I am removed from the Vidal Company's activities. My withdrawal resulted in very bad feeling on the part of my associates, the Pews, who now accuse me of not acting in the best interests of the stockholders, etc. Never again will I have associates in business. He does admit... I was rather a phony president, seldom about and dodging all regular official work. Later, he would do some experimenting with molded fiberglass. He even put a small factory near my house on the Hudson that I was supposed to manage during the days when I was broke. Luckily, it burned down. Unluckily, it was not insured. Jean was never to be the Henry Ford of aviation, because no one could be. The skies were, even then, too crowded, but he did remark in a letter toward the end of the war, I do find that I am also a fair-haired boy now and that all aviation people agree that the private plane program I tried to swing ten years ago should not have been stopped up. It should be noted that one of the prototypes that he helped develop, with government money, became the helicopter. Once upon a time... The highest American distinction that could befall fifty-two men and women in a given year was to have one's face on the cover of Time magazine. Even Auden was thrilled when he heard that he was the subject of a cover story, and deeply hurt when it was cancelled because the managing editor, nodding beneath his flat rock, had been told that Auden was a fag, and no fag could ever be so honored. This changed in time, but too late for Auden. A lobbyist, to her fingertips, Nina believed implicitly in publicity, particularly cover stories. She also believed that had it not been for her lifelong selfless service to undeserving husbands, lovers, and children, she herself could have been a very great celebrity indeed, though in what field it was never clear. Once, she had some cards printed, announcing that she was an interior decorator. Certainly, she had talent in that field, but between drink and sloth, she never set, as it were, 
a sofa right. Even so, fame, rightfully, should have been hers. The day my father brought Time magazine home, she threw the magazine in his face, which was also the one on the cover. Since their relations were relatively good at the time, this was indeed a loud cry from a jealous and competitive heart. In 1976, some eighteen years after I had got her out of my life for good, I was on the cover of Time. A few months before, she had written me, begging for money, and I had sent her seven or eight thousand dollars. Money duly banked, she wrote Time, in the infamous attack on me. I have a copy of the letter in front of me. Nina notes, apropos Exeter, that they would not take me in after the summer school because I had been caught cheating. However, she wrote, with tears and pleading, I got them to let him continue. There were no tears or pleading. She never set foot in Exeter, even when I graduated. But there is some truth to the cheating. Each class sat at a round table with pull-out leaves. During a written test, the master would wander about the room or look out the window while we answered the test questions that had been put to us. One lad, a heavy breather, often looked over my shoulder to see my answers. Finally, hot breath on my neck one time too many, I broke. Here, I muttered and shoved the paper toward him. At that moment, the master turned around. We were both put on probation. I was not able to explain to the principal my exasperation without getting the heavy breather into even deeper trouble. But, more to the point, I knew that even if I had been able to explain the nature of my gesture, ironic, not collusive, the irony would never have registered in so literal a place. Since English was my best subject, it was decided that, at worst, I was an accomplice. I was duly warned and allowed to come back in the fall. But honesty now requires me to say that I cheated at almost every mathematics examination. Otherwise, I could not have graduated, a matter of some urgency with the war on and a high school education necessary to get into the Army's training program. My breach of Exeter's honor system never gave me the slightest pause. After all, it was their honor system, not mine a means of getting us to sneak on one another. None of us had been consulted in the matter, nor had we sworn an oath. We were simply told, and that was that. And I have never thought much of rules arbitrarily imposed on me by others for their convenience. For me, in those days, honor was Billy the Kid. Kill my friend, and I will kill you. Da has duly noted my ambition, but fears that I will turn out like my mother and her brother, indolent Washington types who believed implicitly in the law of the lobbyist. It's not what you know, it's who you know. The power to excel is not the same as the desire to excel, he writes me. You know, a West Texas jackrabbit has a habit of running on three feet until pressed by the hounds. Then he puts down his fourth foot and runs off and leaves them. Da wants to see my fourth foot in action. I suppose I wanted to see the hounds first. Nina was leaving Auchincloss. She was packing up. I had been on a trip to Canada with my father. He dropped me off at Marywood. Early evening. I had one suitcase. In a few weeks, I would be going back to Exeter for my last year. Nina was drinking, smoking, packing in a haphazard way. I had been given one of Whistler's Venice etchings, which hung in the celebrated small bedroom. She forgot to take it. Furniture shrouded in white dust covers. Everywhere, open boxes, suitcases, trunks. Nina is alone. Her Bavarian maid, Maria, is on holiday. Nina is spoiling for a row. Jean, given to mischief, now gives her a splendid occasion an insurance policy left over from their married days. As only Jean paid the premiums, he can do with it as he likes. He turns it over to me to use when I'm of age. But she wants that policy. Right now. I say, no, I'll need it later when I start my career. She rages, all the while puffing smoke, drinking Queen Anne scotch, packing linen, silver. 
a hot, humid August night on the Potomac Palisades. Bloodshot eyes, puffy body, and many, many grievances. The prenuptial agreement ensures that there will be no more money for her other than the agreed-upon thousand dollars a month for life, and a certain amount for her two small children, whose custody she somewhat absently demanded and got from Hudy. A thousand dollars a month in those days was like ten thousand now, enough to get by on. There should have been more somehow, but there was not. Because, let's face it, I'm always the fall guy. I'm the guy who will always give you the shirt off his back. That insurance policy was always mine. It's the least he could do for me after I married him and got him into aviation because I knew Burdett Wright. Why, if it hadn't been for me, he'd still be a football coach up at West Point, or worse, Oregon or some place just as bad. But lucky for him, it was my friendship with Amelia and Slim Lindbergh that got him to the Luddingtons and that first airline, which I put together out of nothing, nothing at all, and even served the first lunch myself, first meal ever on an airplane from Washington to New York. Consomme in cardboard cups with those hard-boiled eggs. I mean, let's face it. Your father's a failure, or was until he married me, and I gave him entree. This was a favorite lobbyist's word, meaning, I am the daughter of Senator Gore, and if you would like any special legislation passed by his subcommittee, I will be happy to arrange it for you for a fee. I don't think Nina ever put her case quite so bluntly, nor was she curiously at all greedy for money other than her vague, almost metaphysical sense that the world's contents were hers by divine right, and only the malevolence of others had denied her, to use today's cant word, so many due entitlements. Over the years, she kept adding newer and wilder details to the scenario of her life, as she collected injustice on a grand scale, she reinvented everything. As fellow flyers, Earhart and Lindbergh were my father's friends, not hers, as well as colleagues in several airlines. She contributed nothing other than an imaginary entree to the Senate, where none was needed, since my father was a favorite at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House, where Senator Gore was by then an enemy marked for destruction. Years later, after I was on the cover of Time, she wrote the editor a long letter denouncing Jean and me. Even Time dared not print more than a paragraph, under the title, A Mother's Love. From her original deposition, We started the Luddington Airline in 1930, my emphasis. My father, Senator Gore, was going to finance it, but the 1929 crash depleted his resources. After about a year, Jean tired of it and retired from the company. The truth was that between September 1930 and February 1933, the Luddington line flourished. Then, as so often happened in those early days, it was merged with another airline and metamorphosed as Eastern Airlines. By then, Jean had left, not at all tired of the company, because President Roosevelt had appointed him Director of Air Commerce in March 1933. He was 37, and from what I now read in the press and see in the newsreels of those days, he was not only a highly romantic figure, but he was also, as one historian of aviation put it, the high priest of flight. Nina's gloss on all this is bold. Finally, after rough going, my father got the poor man an appointment through Franklin Roosevelt as director of aeronautics. Then I felt I'd done my duty and went to Reno, taking Gore with me. Thus, God must have sounded on the seventh day. Finally, that hot night, with a cry, she threw the inevitable glass at me. Once, in a candid mood, she confessed that rage made her orgasmic. I forgot to ask her if sex ever did, but I did enjoy her candor about herself. In the middle of the night, I left Marywood forever, carrying a suitcase that got heavier and heavier with each mile I walked. 
The house is set back a good distance from what was then a country lane, which then connected with the river road, two or three miles from Chain Bridge. I walked, sweating heavily, as far as the bridge. Found a taxi. Said I had no money, but I'd lend the driver my signet ring until my father paid him back. Luckily, Jean was at a hotel in the city. He paid the driver. I slept on a sofa. The next morning, I moved back home to Rock Creek Park. In the morning, Dot was fully dressed for once and very grim. Nina had rung to say that I am to be thrown out of the house. She's drinking. Dot was unusually blunt. The matter of drink is almost always euphemized in Southern families, but now the line came out hard and clear. Da was nowhere to be seen. I'll go on to East Hampton, Jean's summer place on Long Island. You'll stay right here, and you'll read to Da, she added, giving her not entirely altruistic game away. We could hear Nina's car as it came into the driveway. Go on upstairs. I'll handle this. Ordinarily, Dot was an affectionate, rather absent-minded woman, but she also had very much the gift of command, inherited, no doubt, from her slave-owning mother. I see Dot most vividly on the lawn in Rock Creek Park, small, plump, pink wrapper, hair uncombed. She has a piece of hard-boiled egg in her hand. She whistles. A cardinal, a bright red bird indigenous to the south, drops from a tree onto her wrist and eats the egg. Birds, animals, all came to her with no fear. I stationed myself in the room above the front door with a clear view of the driveway. Nina stood beside the fountain and delivered her summing up for the prosecution. A formidable brief, replete with detailed instances of betrayals, deceits, and crimes against her goodness, to which, she proclaimed, with Jeffersonian splendor, there were finally limits. She was now going to live for herself at last. She, who had given too much of herself to me, was damned if she was going to give up that insurance policy that was hers by right. And how could I, with any conscience, take her money when she was the guy who had got Hudie to create a $25,000 trust fund for me as part of the prenuptial agreement? As it turned out, Nina pocketed every penny of the small income from that fund until I was twenty-one, when the interest was paid directly to me. The tirade of self-justification was, as always, of Supreme Court caliber. Ten generations of lawyers, starting back in County Donegal, must seriously affect the DNA code. Now you must throw him out. He is our grandson, an icy bronze voice that I'd never heard before from Dot. He stays here. I am the mother. Under law, I'm his guardian. Under the law, this is my house, not yours. Now you go away. Nina, stunned, rallied. I'm coming in. Oh, no, you're not. With that, I could no longer see Dot from my window, but apparently she had slipped inside the house and slammed the door so hard that the house shook. Nina got back in the car and drove off. Dot came into the room. I was still at the window. You heard that? It was statement, not question. I don't know why it is, she spoke with a kind of wonder, but whenever my daughter appears upon the scene, it is like an evil spirit. I said nothing. Dot smiled. Remember when this was your room? As I have already noted, my first memory is of that room and of my head stuck between the slats of the playpen. Then Dot told me that it was she who had freed me. The Selgrave Club during the Christmas holiday of 1942 I had not seen Jimmy since the fall of 1939, when I had been shipped off to the Los Alamos Ranch School in New Mexico, where one lived the vigorous life, much of it on horseback. The next year I moved on to Exeter. Nina wanted to keep me as far away from her field of operations as possible, and for once, we were in accord. The deterioration of her marriage with Hudie was disagreeable for everyone. 
Since Jean had remarried by then and moved to New York, I saw him only in the summers, and so, as always, it was the Gores in Rock Creek Park who represented home during my exile, a life at whose emotional center was not my family, but Jimmy. Yet we never wrote each other. Of course, boys don't write boys, more or less on manly principle. Even so, since I thought so much about him, I am surprised that I was so unenterprising. We had last seen each other as fourteen-year-old boys. Now we were seventeen-year-old men. Would we take up where we had left off in the spring of 1939, on a May day, in the woods above the Potomac River? We met awkwardly in the ballroom. We wore tuxedos. Girls wore long dresses. An orchestra played such novelties as The Lambeth Walk and The Big Apple, also slow foxtrots, night and day. I could only turn right. Now I erase a bit of Jimmy as Rosalind appears, demanding, if not equal, fair time. I had brought Rosalind to the dance. She was tall and dark and exuberant. We had known each other all our lives. We had been a couple for several years. We were used to each other in a low-key, comfortable way. Then the war came and everything changed. The desultory boy-girl relationship of our old life suddenly became urgent. The boy might soon be killed. We experienced what so many did in our time and place. We decided to get married between my graduation from Exeter in June and my enlistment in the Army in July— a special army program for high school graduates was the army's siren song. Our announcement galvanized my usually casual family. My grandfather, Senator Gore, I never give advice, was suddenly Polonius. He also changed his usual line from never have children, only grandchildren, to be not fruitful, do not multiply. Certainly, his son and daughter had always been annoying to him and of little consequence to anyone else, while I, who read to him gladly, had been a treasure. But treasure no longer, since I seemed to be following both son and daughter into premature marriage, to be followed by certain failure in life's great adventure. Nina was concerned about the alcoholism in Rosalind's family. Even my amiably offhand father came down to Washington to ask a significant question. How much do you think you'll need to live on? I said about five hundred dollars a month. Jean wondered where this would come from. An army private makes considerably less. I already knew that there would be nothing from my family, ever. It was a close contest who was meaner, T.P. Gore or Jean Vidal, two self-made men who had no intention of contributing one penny to the making of any other man beyond the grim obligation to pay for a son's education. Education was the key to everything, as my uneducated mother knew when she approached Mr. True, head of the lower school at St. Albans. My grades must improve because, she said, he is living in the lap of luxury now, but he's never going to inherit anything and he doesn't understand the value of money, a favorite refrain. Mr. True said that my grades would probably improve if I could be persuaded to do more homework. She confessed defeat. He locks himself in his room, she said sadly, and writes. As it turned out, I did not go to college after the war, while my income during my first year of civilian life was about $500 a month. I could very easily have married and, conforming to every last one of the rules of the game, followed my grandfather into the Senate. Happily, life was to be more interesting than that. Unhappily, Rosalind, whom I did not marry, became an alcoholic, not on my account. Happily, in later life, Rosalind pulled herself together to become a commercial artist in London, where she had an affair with Churchill's attorney general, John Foster, a large, bear-like man of marvelous wit. I last saw the two of them in 1970 at the airport in Kathmandu, where, on the tarmac, John gave a superb imitation of the judge in the Margaret Argyle divorce case. 
This featured a compromising Polaroid of the Duchess sucking the cock of a man whose head is not visible in the Polaroid and whose pubic hair was not straight like the Duke's, the valet's solemn testimony, but curly like, like an adulterer's. You are a jeweler, sir, by trade, said the judge. I pray you, sir, note the ring on the hand that is holding the penis. Disregard the penis. Disregard the hand. Disregard the headless man. Concentrate your attention, sir, solely upon the ring. Is that your handiwork? But all this was far in the future that evening when I told Jimmy that I was going to marry Rosalind after I graduated from Exeter. You're crazy, he said. We went downstairs to the men's room with its tall marble urinals and large cubicles. I wondered what, if anything, he felt. After all, men are not boys. Fortunately, our bodies still fitted perfectly together as we promptly discovered inside one of the cubicles, standing up, belly to belly, talking of girls and marriage and coming simultaneously. Thus, we were whole for what proved to be the last time for the two of us, and for me, if not for him, for good. I not only never again encountered the other half, but by the time I was twenty-five, I had given up all pursuit, settling for a thousand brief anonymous adhesions, as Walt Whitman would put it, where wholeness seems, for an instant, to be achieved. Quite enough, I think, if the real thing has happened. At least in platonic terms, I had completed myself once. Jack Kennedy, a half of the hermaphrodite rather than the male, by his own admission, never came close. I am lucky. He was not. The truth is, my war was not much. With a hundred other Washington boys of seventeen, I marched into Union Station and onto an ancient train that let us off in or near Lexington, Virginia, where the Virginia Military Institute, VMI, was. The school's cadets continued about their business while we occupied similar but unequal barracks. We were to be trained as engineers and, of course, soldiers. I was hopeless, as always, at mathematics. But I liked Major Willard, the physics teacher, who told me, July 1943, that the atom had been broken and that somewhere out west we were creating what would be the most powerful bomb in history. So much for the top secretness of the Manhattan Project. Out west, I later learned, along with the rest of the world, was the Los Alamos Ranch School, taken over by the government a year or two after I left. The main house of the original school is now a museum showing how the place looked before the government built its city on the mesa. I am told that there are, in a glass case, the chaps that I left so happily behind, my name pinned to them like a relic. I wrote a good deal of dark verse at VMI. I also enjoyed the company of a VMI English teacher who was surprisingly literary, but then he was a relative of Ellen Glasgow, an excellent Richmond novelist now forgotten. Since the three-month term was about to end, I realized that the Army was getting ready to abandon our training program. I signaled my uncle, the commanding officer of a fighter wing at Peterson Field, Colorado Springs, and so I leaped, as it were, away from the door to the slaughterhouse through which my classmates were now obliged to pass. I already knew too much politics to be willing to die in Roosevelt's war. Nina, of course, claimed credit for my transfer. I got gore, she confided to Time magazine, into the Air Force. But, of course, she did not. My time stateside is a blur, at Peterson Field, we lived in Quonset huts, heated in winter with black, iron, coal-burning stoves. We alternated as CQs, charge of quarters, to stoke the coals all night long in below-zero weather. I recall a handsome, red-haired southern boy who could neither read nor write. When I was CQ, he'd often stay in the hut rather than go into Colorado Springs, and I'd tell him stories, like a child. I even tried Shakespeare on him, Romeo and Juliet. 
He loved the plot, but then he came from feuding country, and for him, the Hatfields and the McCoys were no different from the Montagues and Capulets. The verse, what I could recall, moved him, and he would idly play with what he called his fuckpole, but in no provocative way. As Dr. Kinsey would discover, there was a great deal of same sex going on. In the States, it was dangerous on post, but in nearby Colorado Springs, there were many men eager to know us, and once, after I was blown by an old man of perhaps thirty, my absolute cutoff age, he offered me ten dollars, which I took. As a result, I, alone in the family, did not condemn Jackie's marriage to Onassis, since I, too, had once been a small player in the commodities exchange market. From Peterson Field to Lake Pontchartrain as a deckhand on an army crash boat. I knew more about boats than anything else of use to the Air Corps, other than being a clerk non-typist. We were stationed at the so-called Irish Canal. Our job was to pick up wet flyboys, pilots in training who had ended up in the large lake. In time, I passed an examination for first mate by memorizing most of a navigation book— my eyes were too bad to get into officer's candidate school. So I became a warrant officer, junior grade, and transferred to the Transportation Corps at Fort Lewis, Seattle, Washington. The night before we went overseas, I was in the Snake Pit Bar of the Olympia Hotel in Seattle. Smoky, raw wood-paneled dive, powerful smell of beer, cheap ivory soap fog-damp wool uniforms, and bodies that smelled and looked as different from today's bodies as science-fiction earthlings differ from deodorized androids. We were a lean, sinewy, sweaty race, energized by sex and fear of death, the ultimate aphrodisiac. Bodies were different then. No one was fat, unlike most Americans today. These were depression boys, I recently watched some old pornographic films of the period. I had forgotten what the so-called working man's body was like. Thick-thighed, flat-chested, with muscular arms, not as comely as an aerobic-styled body of today, but solider, uncalculated, earth-like. Certain that I was going to be killed wherever it was that the ships would take us the next day, I thought that I should at least experiment with a potential jimmy. For the first time, I picked up someone, a merchant mariner. He was delighted. I noted that he wore a wedding ring, but then half the hunters in the bar were fleshing out Dr. Kinsey's as-yet-uncharted graph from one to six— those exclusively heterosexual were one, homosexual, six. Two through five were swingers between one and six. In the snake pit bar, the golden mean prevailed, as I suspect it does throughout the race. We tried to get a room in the hotel. All were taken except for a samples room. We took that. The room was a corridor with a long table where salesmen could line up samples of whatever it was that they were selling. At the far end, in an alcove, there was a bed. I was nineteen, just under six feet, weighing in at one hundred and fifty pounds. He was twenty-five and weighed about one hundred seventy pounds. He was shorter than I, but we seemed a fair fit. Once in bed, I realized that I had no plan. This proved to be an error. Suddenly, he was on my back. I tried to push him off. He used an expert half-Nelson in order to shove part way in. I bucked like a horse from the pain and threw us both off the bed. We rolled across the floor, slugging at each other. Then, exhausted, we separated. He cursed, dressed, left. That was my first and last experience of being nearly fucked. By ship we sailed up Prince Rupert's Channel to Anchorage, Alaska, I got drunk for the first time New Year's Eve, 1944-45. I was reprimanded. Then out to the islands, the chain, as the Aleutians were known. Palimpsest from Willowa, my first novel. The main street of Dutch Harbor curved parallel with the beach for half a mile. Most of the houses were on this street. 
Bars and restaurants and one theater, all wooden, also lined the street. The buildings had been painted white originally. They were many weathered shades of gray now. On a small hill, behind two bars and a former brothel, was the old Russian Orthodox church, with two onion-shaped cupolas painted green, while the rest of the church was an almost new white. On several lanes, running inland from the main street, were the homes of the two hundred-odd pre-war residents. Most of the houses had been vacated, and the windows were boarded up, and the privies leaned crazily in the backyards. Seven trees, which had been imported, were withered now, and their limbs had been made grotesque by the constant wind. A mile inland from the shore and the village was the army camp. It had been erected early in the war, and its many barracks and offices duplicated the military life of the distant United States. Soldiers from the post and sailors from the navy ships in the harbor wandered about the crooked lanes and along the main street. They were looking for liquor and women. There was much of one and little of the other in Dutch Harbor. Prices were high for both. I took over as first mate of freight supply ship Thirty Five, operating between Chernowski Bay on the island of Unamak, according to the atlas. We called it Umnak, to Dutch Harbor. We made a weekly trip carrying cargo and seasick soldiers. The Aleutians were barren volcanic islands, home to huge ravens and small foxes, with beaches strewn with moonstones and jasper. From Willowa, Major Barkison contemplated the sea and was pleased by it. Today the water was smooth and only occasionally disturbed by gusts of wind. The major stood alone on the forward deck. A few miles to his left was the vanishing entrance to Dutch Harbor. Before him was the Bering Sea. The water of the Bering Sea was a deep blue black, and the major watched carefully the ship-made waves. Black when with the sea mass, then varying shades of clear blue as they swept up into the large waves, exploding at last in sudden whiteness. When he had the time, Major Barkison appreciated beauty. He had three days now in which to be appreciative. Several sea lions wallowed fearlessly near the ship; their black coats glistened in the pale morning light. For a moment, they dove and splashed near the ship, and then, quickly, they went away. Major Barkison had a sure method of foretelling weather, or anything else, for that matter. He would, for instance, select a certain patch of sky and then count slowly to three. If during that time no seagull crossed the patch of sky, the thing he wanted would come true. This method could be applied to everything, and the major had great faith in it. He looked at a section of sky above a distant volcano. Slowly he counted. At the count of two, a gull flew across his patch of sky. The major frowned. He had a way, however, of dealing with this sort of thing. He would use the best two counts out of three. Quickly he counted. No gull appeared. The trip would not be bad. In his mind, though, he wondered if it might not be cheating to take the best two out of three. One had to play fair. Not that he was superstitious, of course. As it proved, the major was in for a willowa. A sudden wind out of the mountains that my fictional ship, like my actual one, the FS Thirty Five, barely survived. I suffered a drenching in below zero weather, hypothermia. A few days later, while docking at Dutch Harbor, I tried to leap from bow to dock, and my knee locked. Something had gone wrong. The hospital at Fort Richardson, Anchorage, X-rayed me, rheumatic fever. Since we could select a hospital near home for recovery, I picked Van Nuys, California, to be near not Nina at the Beverly Hills Hotel, but the movies. I would hitchhike into Hollywood and hang around the studios, and. Endless fascination. In the summer of 1945, I left Birmingham General Hospital at Van Nuys, California, on leave to see my father in New York. I had acquired rheumatoid arthritis as a result of a modest freezing 
hypothermia in the Bering Sea. One knee was partly locked, and the fingers of my left hand were like thumbs. Yes, everything is a bit worse now. When I went before the hospital board, I was told that I could get a disability pension for life, but that would mean two years more of service. If I chose to forego the pension, I would be let out in less than a year. The European war was over, the Japanese war nearly so. I let the pension go. En route to New York, I stopped off in Jackson, Michigan, to see my father's sister, we were standing in a sunny garden when we were joined by a boy I had been at school with. Which school? Even then, Nina's educational enthusiasms had begun to blur. Potomac, Sidwell, Friends, Landon, St. Albans, Los Alamos, Exeter. But since the boy spoke of Washington, it must have been one of the local schools. You know, he said, Jimmy Trimble's dead. By this time, I had pretty much distanced myself from these stark announcements. I think my first reaction must have been somewhat like that when I heard Jack Kennedy had been shot. I was in a Rome movie house watching David and Lisa. News spread during the interval. I didn't believe it. There had been a mistake. That's not the right plot. But, of course, finally, that was all that Jack was ever to be a great media monster, now wreathed in garlands of paranoia of a most unpleasant sort. Jimmy was no media monster, but he was already vivid in his own right, and thus no candidate for death. It took me some months to absorb the fact, or non-fact, of his being not being. To this day, in another world and almost another century, I have wondered what might have become of our so swiftly completed maleness. Is it only for a season that wholeness endures? On this matter Plato is silent. Experience suggests that desire of any kind is brief. In due course, I wrote a novel in which I described what might have happened had we met again years later— the conclusion was too harsh for many readers, but that is the way American society is, and I was a realistic writer until, one day, I realized that there is no common reality beyond desire, the pursuit, and, in at least one case, the achievement of the whole. It would be greedy, not to say impractical, to expect a repetition of a lucky accident. I was very much aware of my once perfect luck— and left it at that. I sit with Da in the living room of his flat in Crescent Place, just across the street from the stately house of Agnes and Eugene Meyer, owners of the Washington Post, that official voice of empire. The Rock Creek Park House was sold in the war, impossible to heat. I am still in uniform, a warrant officer back from the Aleutians. Da rocks in his mission chair, discusses my political career in what he calls the New Mexico option, because Oklahoma is too volatile. He always winced at the thought of his Bible-loving constituency. Of course, you were born in New York. Why not take advantage of that? Why not get yourself a district in the city? You pay Tammany Hall your first year's salary, and, except for city matters, they leave you alone. I thought this a dead end. Those crowds he begins, turning off Fulton Lewis, Jr. Amos and Andy would soon be on, his favorite comedy, swarming with politically incorrect Negro stereotypes. Those crowds that Wilson saw in Europe. He shakes his head. The white hair is now all on end as two cowlicks meet, and Dot will soon have to start unsnarling and combing them straight. I suppose any man's head would be turned by them. Now Roosevelt has gone to Yalta. At least there won't be any crowds, but he'll be just like Wilson. He won the war, and he'll make the peace, or so he thinks. But Churchill and Stalin will be too smart for him, just as Lloyd George and Clemenceau were too smart for Wilson. Then there's the fact he's dying, which doesn't help matters. It is curious how everyone knows everything in Washington, while the people of the country, at least in those days, know nothing about their rulers. Until television, 
Our capital was always rather like the secret Kremlin in its Stalinist glory days. We all knew, but the public did not, that Crown Princess Martha of Norway, the president's last love, had moved into the White House, and that Missy Lehand, Maîtress en titre, and secretary, moved out and died of a broken heart. When Roosevelt, in front of the newsreel cameras, presented the Crown Princess with a warship, our nomenclatura whispered, How like him! Most men give their mistress diamonds, but not our czar. He gives her a destroyer. Then we talked of the past. He had got into the habit of answering my long questioning letters with long ones of his own. I thought that his to me were lost in the war when my mother threw out all my clothes, books, and papers, on the sensible ground that, like Jimmy, I'd not be coming back. But apparently Da kept not only my letters, but carbons of his own to me. Excerpts have been published in World Literature Today by one Marvin J. LaHood, who found the collection at a university library. It is nice to hear Da's voice again. Disconcerting to hear my own, a sort of schoolboy Machiavelli, with, alas, a non-Machiavellian fury to be in the right, like my politically martyred grandfather. Apparently, the senator wrote me an eleven-page disquisition on Roosevelt's character, not quoted in full, but I can guess its gist. Like his fifth cousin Teddy and his former commander-in-chief Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt had always been eager to play an imperial role on the world scene. To make internal improvements in a country like the United States was as difficult then as it is now. I always thought Da somewhat invidious whenever he discussed the ever more imperial trappings of the presidency and the blaze of world publicity, which, from Wilson's triumph at Versailles to Bush's vomiting in the lap of the Japanese prime minister, was the outward and visible sign of our imperium's military glory and economic primacy. But all that is now quickly fading away, and one can see how quaintly prescient we were over fifty years ago. The correspondence begins on March 9th, 1940. I am at the Los Alamos Ranch School in Ottawa, New Mexico. Apparently, I've been reading about the First World War and Gore's ambivalent maneuverings in the Senate. Gore explains his resolution that warned American citizens not to exercise the right to travel on the armed ships of a belligerent. I introduced that resolution two or three days after the celebrated Sunrise Conference, which is now historic. I thought then that we were speeding headlong into war, as we were. For someone brought up in the wreckage of the Civil War, any foreign war seemed like perfect folly. For someone who detested the country's ruling class, the idea of a war that would be profitable only to the Rockefellers and to the Morgans was insupportable. Certainly, those who actually fought the war would not do well out of it. But then, they never do. From one of Jimmy Trimble's last letters to his mother from Iwo Jima, After the war, we won't receive any credit for having been out here. It's the smart guy who stays in the States earning money. I'm not even getting much self-satisfaction by telling myself that I'm at least doing my part, for peace of mind does no good if anything happens. Three weeks later, something happened. When I wrote in a memorial issue of Newsweek about the war and Jimmy's death, letters from ex-Marines began to arrive. They are still in a rage at what was done to them, not to mention all the dead. I had lunch with Jimmy's mother in Washington not long ago, our first meeting in fifty-five years. At ninety, Ruth Trimble Sewell is like a woman of fifty. She is alert, straight-backed, with blue eyes like Jimmy's, only just beginning to fade. Over lunch, we brought him back to life, briefly, each for his own purpose. She had been disturbed by the revelation in a magazine that the J.T. to whom I had dedicated the city and the pillar, about one boy's love for another, was Jimmy Trimble, and the journalist made it as clear as he could with no corroboration from me, that we had been schoolboy lovers. Of Jimmy's death at nineteen on Iwo Jima, 
The journalist quoted me as saying, He was the unfinished business of my life, a response as cryptic as it was accurate. Kind friends, Mrs. Sewell emphasized the adjective in her Washington, Kentucky accent, wrote me from all over to say how upset I must be. Perhaps I overreacted. She had given Jimmy's letters to a master at St. Albans, who was aware of my interest in... What? Bringing him to life again? In order to... Again. What? Discover who he was? As if I hadn't once known him as well as I knew myself? But since we had been separated by geography the last years of his short life, I suppose that I wanted, now, to fill in the details. I shall but love thee better after death, as Mrs. Browning so stonily put it. Yes, perhaps I overreacted. She ordered a single vodka martini. She had been born in Washington, a belle of the town, one year older than my mother, whom she remembered. So good-looking, she said tactfully. Ruth told me of Jimmy's first report home after a weekend in the great house in Virginia where I was prince, he pauper. Of course, we were interchangeable, as I was not really prince, but only living for a time as princes do. Upon my mother's divorce from Hudy, when I was sixteen, I too became pauper. But I am intrigued by a letter he wrote his mother from Guam in the South Pacific. Would she send him Whitman's Leaves of Grass? This set off a tremor. He and I had certainly lived out the calamus idol. Now someone, a lover, had suggested that he read Whitman. Is this to be a mystery story? Who was he, after all? Will I ever know now? Mrs. Sewell picked at her elaborate lobster dish. The dining room at Willard's, as we used to call the hotel, was half full. The hotel is not very like the original Willard's, where Lincoln stayed. It was entirely rebuilt at the beginning of the century, and lately, rather well redone. I am at home with the result. Across Pennsylvania Avenue from the hotel is the Commerce Department, and from the windows of my room I can look into what had been my father's second-floor office when he was director of Air Commerce, a corner office at the west end of the building, with windows shaded by a row of pillars set in a ledge, already darkened, even then, by the excrement of those multitudinous pigeons who were, and are, almost as numerous as civil servants in our now imperial capital city. Tell me, did he ever talk to you about his father? I said that I couldn't remember. I had always assumed that his father was dead. I did know that there was a stepfather whom he disliked. She frowned. Well, he and I were not married long. Then I married Mr. Sewell, and we lived happily ever after until last year, when he died. So you see, she said with no dramatic emphasis, I am bereft. I had been in her apartment earlier that morning. Over the mantel was a painting of Jimmy made in 1937. He is holding a model sailboat. Though he smiled a lot in life, in almost all his pictures he looks grave, eyes usually turned from painter or camera lens. I have a life-size reproduction of the painting on the wall beside my bed. Jimmy is looking to his right, to the west, to the approaching end, I morbidly think. Jimmy used to be excused from class so that he could go sit for his portrait. He was also excused, from time to time, for surgical enlargement of his urethra. I never knew what this condition was called medically, and I was not about to mention it to Mrs. Sewell. Jimmy said that it was a remarkably painful, slow business. Mrs. Sewell described his first serious girlfriend. She was absolutely beautiful, but she wasn't really... Well, once I asked her to help with the punch bowl, to fill cups, you know, and she refused. She was... But the word common did not pass her lips, because I always tried to love anyone he loved. Then he met Chris White that last year and wanted to marry her. You mean Chris White the actress? She was surprised. You know who she is? Yes, she was an actress on television a long time ago. 
In the 50s, Chris White was a successful television actress who almost invariably got the parts that my friend Joanne Woodward wanted. When Joanne received the Academy Award, I wired her, Where is Chris White tonight? So here was Chris White yet again, Jimmy's final love, except, perhaps, for whoever it was who got him to read Whitman. When they sent me Jimmy's footlocker, I burned all the letters to him from girls. Hers, too. But Chris, a Washington girl, continued to see Mrs. Sewell after the war. Then, some years ago, she dropped from view. Mrs. Sewell laughed. I remember Jimmy asked me once, Did you ever tell a man that he was beautiful? Jimmy had been shocked at such a word applied to himself by a girl. But then, in those days before Tennessee Williams and Marlon Brando, males were taught to think of themselves as coarse and brutish calibans on a lower level of evolution than the fragile aerials of the other sex. Suddenly, Mrs. Sewell turned to me. I want to ask you a question, she said. Our roles reversed. What did Jimmy tell you about his stepfather? He said he didn't get on with him, and that was why he moved into the dormitory. Jimmy had not said much more than that. I suppose they disliked each other. No, my husband didn't dislike Jimmy. I'm afraid he liked him altogether too much. I could not believe what she was telling me. He was German, a fine decorator, a great horseman, master of the Warrenton Hunt, a popular man, but he wanted to adopt Jimmy and change his name, which I couldn't allow. I mean, the Trimbles would have been horrified. Jimmy was James Trimble the Third. Then she looked very grim. One day, I found a letter written to my husband from a man who was, like him, in green ink, she added, the smoking gun, as it were, and that was the end for me. We were divorced. Funny, I've only told two other people this story, the real story. So Jimmy had become a boarder in order to escape from his stepfather. I am still startled by all the implications. Had anything happened between them? If so, what? As I replay the ancient tapes of memory, I begin to see the story from quite a new angle. I had always thought that I had been the seducer, as I was to prove to be for the rest of my life, and so it had never occurred to me that it might have been the other way around. Like me, Jimmy would have found repellent the idea of a sexual act with a grown man. But with another boy, an equal other half, it is the most natural business there is. Yet if he had made the first move, if it were possible... I would like to re-edit all the tapes, but they are now so fragile with age that they would probably turn to dust, as Jimmy has, in a box at Rock Creek Cemetery near the statue of the mysterious veiled youth that Henry Adams commissioned St. Gordon's to make as a memorial to his wife, Clover, and to who knows what else. Now there is a second startling mystery, along with the first one that I found in his letters to his mother. I moved to safer ground. Did Jimmy go to Mrs. Shippen's? Ruth laughed. Well, I used to aim him there, but I can't say if he ever arrived. He thought the girls were a bit on the plain side. Mrs. Sewell was a strong character. When the war turned bad for us, Jimmy had wanted to enlist in the Marines. He was seventeen, an age when one needed parental consent. I got mine readily. But Ruth had refused to give hers, and so he had stayed at Duke University on a scholarship paid for by the Washington Senators. At seventeen, when he graduated from St. Albans, I was doing the same at Exeter, he was offered contracts to play professional baseball with both the New York Giants and the Washington Senators. Each club would have sent him to college and kept him out of the war. Loyal to his native city, he chose the Senators. But then, when he came of age at eighteen, he enlisted. The last letters that he wrote to her are more those of husband to wife than son to mother. I had also not realized how much of an artist an athlete is until I read, again and again, about my arm, the pitcher's arm, which he guarded with the same single-mindedness that a dancer does his legs. Toward the end, he knows that he is not going to survive, 
and he tells her what to do about insurance and his effects. And Chris. He is plainly in a rage at being killed before he could have his life. I think I'd like to make a little book about Jimmy. Photographs, letters, what people remember. Mrs. Sewell was on her guard, as well she should be after that magazine article. I told her of a similar book about Hobie Baker, a Princeton athlete much admired by Scott Fitzgerald's generation. Of course, she said, I wouldn't want anything said about his father and his problems. Jimmy's father had left Washington under a series of clouds. He was thought to be dead until he did indeed die years later in California. I said that I had no interest in the father. After all, the subject never came up between Jimmy and me. But then he was a boy who could keep secrets, as I was about to learn. I assured her that the book would be largely based on his letters to her. Copies of several of them had been shown me by the master at St. Albans, who, that morning, before my lunch with Mrs. Sewell, had also given me a tour of the school. The gray, gothic-style stone of the original buildings still harmonizes agreeably with the now-finished cathedral on its hill, separated from the school by a green herb garden and tall trees. The lower school dormitory of my day, with its flimsy partitions and linoleum floor, has been replaced by a row of small cell-like rooms. So all of our ghosts are gone. I did push open the swinging door to the shower room to find that our communal Spartan shower was now modestly compartmentalized. Why did Jimmy ask his mother to send him Whitman? Why am I jealous of a ghost, two ghosts? Did he find a lover in the Marines, someone of a literary nature who wanted him to read? I knew too well the sick, sick dread lest the one he loved might secretly be indifferent to him. So Whitman now resounds in these late, late reveries. Two vivid images of Jimmy. One came back to me while I was smoking ganja in Kathmandu, but as I gasped my way into a sort of trance, Jimmy materialized beside me on the bed. He wore blue pajamas. He was asleep. He was completely present as he had been in the bedroom at Merrywood. I tickled his foot. The calloused sole was like sandpaper. It was a shock to touch him again. The simulacrum opened its blue eyes and smiled and yawned and put his hand alongside my neck. He was, for an instant, real in a hotel room in Kathmandu. But only for an instant. Then he rejoined Achilles and all the other shadowy dead in war. My second memory? I am lying on top of him after sex, eyes shut. Then I open them and see his eyes staring up into mine. The expression is like that of his sad-looking photographs rather than of the actual smiling boy whom I recall or think that I do. In his last photographs, the Marine Private of nineteen looks to be a powerfully built man of thirty, in a rage because he knows that what's next is nothing. After our final encounter at the Selgrave, I knew that we would go on together until our business had finished itself in a natural way. I certainly never wanted to grow old with him. I just wanted to grow up with him. Each would marry in time, find wholeness elsewhere, if lucky. In the light of all this, it is puzzling to me now that I did not write him after he finally joined the Marines in 1944, the worst year of the war. Of course, I was already in the army and concerned with my own fate. So I left Jimmy to time and chance, as I left everything else. But then I hadn't much choice, while a year later, he had none at all. I was stoic since, forever after, I was to be the surviving half of what had once been whole. I realized that according to the school of Vienna, the riding school, I should have become a lifelong pederast. But that did not happen. Naturally, like most men, I am attracted to adolescent males. This is, by the way, one of the best-kept secrets of the male lodge, revealed in a study called The Boys of Boise, where most of the male establishment of that heartland Idaho city 
each a mature married man, were revealed to be lovers of the high school football team. But I did not go prowling for fourteen-year-old athletes. After all, if the ideal is the other self, then that self would have had to age along with me, and attraction would have become affection, and lust would have then been diverted to chance encounters or the other sex. Montaigne is sharp about the Greek arrangement of young warrior and pubescent squire, the latter not enjoying, or supposed to enjoy, what the lustful other does with him. Although this relationship might produce excellent soldiers, it was not and could not be, in Montaigne's eyes, true love, because man and boy were not equals, and the relationship was grounded solely upon the passion of the older and more experienced male for the beauty of the younger. Only in equality can there be love, as Montaigne had uniquely experienced with his friend La Boese's mind and character, if not body. Montaigne thought that if a woman could ever be a man's equal in mind and education, then that relationship might be best of all. But since Montaigne is mildly misogynistic, he gives no examples. Jimmy Trimble had applied for the Navy V-12 program, where high school graduates of 17 and 18 were trained to be naval officers in stateside universities. As of June 1943, I was in the Army's equivalent, the Army Specialized Training Program at the Virginia Military Institute, to be trained as an engineer, for which I had no aptitude. After three months, I flunked out, more or less deliberately, thus saving my life, because, with the Army's usual brutish haste and ill faith, the program was suddenly dissolved, and my inadequately trained classmates were shipped off to Europe as frontline infantrymen. Many were killed in the last German counteroffensive, the so-called Battle of the Bulge. But by then I was first mate of an Army freight supply ship in the Aleutians, more in danger of being killed by my own inadequacies as a navigator in the world's worst sea than from enemy fire. At least, unlike Jack Kennedy, I didn't get run over by a Japanese destroyer. The trick of the week, I always thought, though the latest biography makes more sense than usual of the harebrained fleet of PT boats to which the ailing Jack had been assigned a thousand miles to the south of me. Jimmy, according to a survivor from his unit, failed his physical for V-12, which seems impossible for a professional athlete. Yet I now learn he was indeed sickly, prey to a chronic form of pneumonia. But he had no problem in getting accepted as cannon fodder by the Marines in January of 1944. His basic training was at Camp Lejeune. Then, in August 1944, he became a member of a scout and observer group of the 3rd Marine Division in the South Pacific. He saw action until the end of October, when Guam was secured. From October to February, he seems to have had a quiet time on Guam. For one month, he was again a baseball player, helping the division team win the local championship. On February 4th, he played his last game for the division— he reports to his mother that he has sprained his ankle. Meanwhile, everything is once again wonderful with Chris and me. He remarks that his mother is a worse procrastinator than I ever was. She has not sent him a long-promised picture of herself. So how about sending one while there is still a tomorrow? He recalls the Sunday picnics that they used to have in the Virginia mountains. I'll never forgive myself for refusing to follow your advice to stay in college— after the war, we won't receive any credit for having been out here. Mom, please don't get the blues over what I am going to say, but some insurance should be taken, just in case. Mom, you know, if anything happens to me, you are to have all I possess, but I would like to ask one favor. You know the gold ring with the diamonds set halfway around? Well, Mom, if it won't, anything does happen— would you give it to Chris for me? Kind of a memorial the other way around. Finally. Well, Mom, I'll write again in a couple of days. All my love to the swellest mom in all the world. Your devoted son, Jimmy.
This letter could have been written in the Civil War. The tone is also that of Andy Hardy in an MGM movie, but there were once real boys like that, before the great sullenness spread over the land. February 25th, 1945, Jimmy arrived at Iwo Jima in what turned out to be one of the bloodiest engagements of the war. 20,000 Japanese were killed. 6,821 American troops were killed, mostly teenage Marines. Jimmy was in the 4th Platoon, a member of what was called the Reconnaissance Company. A survivor of the platoon recalls, I was with the first observation team that went up there. We stayed three days, then they relieved us. I saw him, Jimmy, when they relieved us, and that was the last time. They relocated their position forward, lost contact with them, in the early morning hours. There were eight men in Jimmy's squadron as of the night of February 28th. They were arranged, as far as I can tell from a news story, two to a foxhole on a slope overlooking our infantry front line and the enemy's concrete placements beyond. As dawn broke at 4.45, March 1st, 1945, all hell broke loose upon them. A Jap raiding party had infiltrated the front lines and attacked their post. Six of the eight were killed. One was dead in his foxhole. He had been bayoneted in his sleep. Another had been killed by a grenade and a third by rifle fire. One burned poncho was found in the foxhole shared by the two missing men. Sixty-three Jap bodies sprawled in the observation post's little battleground. Jimmy was the scout who had been killed by a grenade. Another Marine who was there bears witness. We were all real proud of Jim Trimble, and everybody else was. He was a joy to be around. He had a good personality. He was always joking. I know he wanted to go back and go to school and play professional baseball. He was just a joy to be around. I remember that he went into the ship's store because it was cold up in Iwo. Everybody thinks of it as the Pacific, but it was their winter up there, and it was only 700 miles from Tokyo. Jim went in and bought a Black Navy watch sweater. He was the only guy that kept warm before this happened. But then, you know, I'll never forget the way the grenade hit him in the back, and that sweater was just all wrapped up inside of him. You know, in circumstances like that, you're probably closer to those guys than you are your own brothers. Of course, for me now, we're talking about fifty years. You kind of forget. Like I said, the wars all kind of blend into each other. He was tall, blonde curly hair. But I'll tell you, he was heavy carrying back. I thought I'd die. At that age, you know, I was eighteen, and I weighed about a hundred and forty-five. He had to weigh one hundred and sixty. He felt like two thousand pounds by the time I got back to the foxhole. My fax machine has suddenly become a time machine. My researcher has found a second Marine who was with Jimmy at Iwo Jima. They served in the same platoon of scouts. Jim Trimble came in around the 1st of January, 1945. We were all strangers to each other. We were immediately sent out on an ambush. The Japanese were harassing some of the natives in a town on the other side of the island, and this is how we started to get acquainted. I think Jim was on one of those first ambush setups. Nobody knew too much about him at first, except we knew that on certain days when we were training, if there wasn't too much going on, they'd come and tell Jim, well, you're pitching today. So he'd leave, and it turned out he was our star pitcher. I think he won 21 consecutive games. We left for Iwo Jima on about February 8th. Then we were at sea four or five days. We went ashore about the 24th or 25th. The day of the 28th, we went up to the front. I remember Jim asking me, in particular, because I had seen combat on Guam, and I'd killed my first man over there and everything. I was probably one of the only ones that had already seen combat. He said, Now, if anything happens tonight, if you were really up against it and you had no choice, would you surrender? I said, not I, because I saw what happened to guys that did surrender on Guam. They'd be tortured and killed. 
So we talked it over and pretty well agreed that that's what we'd do. Fight till the end, no matter what. At just about midnight, the Japs came from below this ridge. There must have been hundreds of them. We only killed 68, but there was just droves of them coming. They started by, off to my right, where Jim Trimble was. Anyway, all hell broke loose. There were hand grenades, shooting, and flares went off. I knew there were some mortar men behind us, but I didn't know how far. All this excitement and this yelling and shooting and everything else, well, it was hard for us to make contact. After things finally settled down about nine or ten in the morning, after we had killed all of them we could, I started looking around for our guys. Being that Jim Trimble's foxhole was the closest, why there I found him, and he was dead. And he'd been shot and bayoneted just like the rest of them there. He had, I don't know how many, bayonet holes in him and was shot. There was nothing we could do with Jim. We took some of his personal belongings off, like a wallet and ring, and we gave them to our officer, who in turn, this was standard procedure, sent them back to their next of kin. Personal things about Jim Trimble? Well, like I say, I probably knew him only six weeks. I remember him telling me, because he was engaged to a girl by the name of Christine White, he said, Boy, we're going to get married. As I remember him, he died with his boots on. We had our little talk just a couple of hours before about what we would do. Instead of getting up and running, which at least one other fellow did, he stayed there and toughed it out like the rest of us, except he got killed. I'm happy to see that someone is interested enough to find out what happened. Another guy in this platoon had a father who owned a publishing company in New York. Several years after, in the front page of our local newspaper, there was his wedding announcement. But that son of a gun, when it came time to go to Iwo, he disappeared. Got himself transferred or something. You never know who you're bumping shoulders with. I, too, took much the same route and transferred from what would have been infantry duty, almost always lethal for those 18 or 19, to the relative peace of the Bering Sea. I think I could have given my life for Jimmy, but I was not about to give anything but a reluctant two and a half years to President Roosevelt's imperial longings. I have never thought that entire war was worth Jimmy's life, or anyone else's. Did you send Jimmy the copy of Leaves of Grass he asked for? Mrs. Sewell was vague. If he asked me to, of course I did. Will I ever know who got him to read Whitman on the island of Guam? When the commanding general heard of Jimmy's death, he was, according to a witness, moist-eyed for one boy lost in all that carnage. The third division named its baseball field on Guam Trimble Field. That was that. No, I am not jealous, only sad I was never to be with him again. Actually, I hoped that he did find someone. He was always lucky, except for his death. And maybe there was luck in that, too. Long life, finally, is nightmarish repetition, while death is beautiful from you. Did he read that in Calamus? Did he read Whitman on the Brotherhood of Lovers? On how together through life, through dangers, odium, unchanging, long and long, through youth and through middle and old age, how unfaltering, how affectionate and faithful they were. Then I am pensive. I hastily walk away, filled with bitterest envy. As who would not? I have now lived a half-century with a man, but sex has played no part in the relationship, and so where there is no desire or pursuit, there is no wholeness. End of Jimmy. Since then, the wars all kind of blend into each other. I had wanted to recreate him through memory, the ultimate possession as well as the last memorial. But tombs are best left shut. Now it is I who am being possessed by him in fast-fading present time. Is Christine White still alive? My last winter in the army, 
1945-46, was spent at Mitchell Field on Long Island. As a semi-invalid, I had been reassigned to the Air Corps, preparing to mustering out. When off base, I stayed at my father's apartment in Fifth Avenue. It was there that I met a woman who was interviewing Jean for a biography of Amelia Earhart. Through her, I met the managing editor of E.P. Dutton, Nicholas Radin, a large, amiable Russian émigré. He not only accepted Willow Waugh for publication, but offered me a job when I got out of the Army. I did not go back to Washington. I stayed in New York. Rosalind had vanished into marriage, but I saw a good deal of her friend Cornelia Claiborne a pretty girl with gray-blue hyperthyroid eyes and an interest in literature. She was helping to start a literary paper, the Hudson Review. I was roped into escorting her to a mass coming-out party at the Waldorf for those girls, deprived by war of what used to be called debuts. Among those present, looking strangled in white tie and tails, was James Merrill, still an undergraduate at Amherst, I was condescending older warrior to unpublished Ephib. In later years, I delighted in his wit and read his poetry with pleasure. Now, conforming to this memoir's inexorable law, he has just died, younger than I. I also discovered, that magical winter, the Everhard Baths, where military men often spent the night, unable to find any other cheap place to stay. This was sex at its rawest and most exciting, and a revelation to me. Newly invented penicillin had removed fears of venereal disease, and we were enjoying perhaps the freest sexuality that Americans would ever know. Most of the boys knew that they would soon be home for good and married, and that this was a last chance to do what they were designed to do with each other. The Astor Bar in Times Square was easily the city's most exciting meeting place for soldiers, sailors, and marines on the prowl for one another. Few civilians and no woman ever dared intrude on these male mysteries. Even the military police and the shore patrol kept their distance. After all, we had, all of us, won the Great Imperial War, and, thanks to us, the whole world was, briefly, American. It was my experience, in the war, that just about everyone, either actively or passively, was available under the right circumstances. Certainly, things were pretty open in the Pacific Islands, where on one, no doubt mythical island, an entire marine division paired off. Although the traditional hysteria about same sexuality ran its usual course in the well-policed army camps stateside, to categorize is to control, bars like the one on the ground floor of the Astor Hotel throve. At any time of day or night, hundreds of men would be packed six deep around the long oval black bar within whose center bartenders presided. Over the image of the bar, I now see one Alfred C. Kinsey, author of Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, Human American Male. Ned Roram noted, since our habits differ from Moroccans, say, none of whom is gay, while all indulge, when possible, in same sexuality. I got to know Kinsey in 1948. His book came out a month after The City and the Pillar, and the shocked New York Times would not advertise either. For a time, Dr. Kinsey used the mezzanine of the Astor as a sort of office where he would interview human males about their sex lives. I think that the somewhat phlegmatic Dr. Kinsey was secretly delighted by this warrior display, and I like to think that it was by observing the easy trafficking at the Astor that he figured out what was obvious to most of us, though as yet undreamed of by American society at large— Perfectly normal young men, placed outside the usual round of family and work, will run riot with each other. Curiously, there were few effeminate types at the bar. They patronized other watering holes. There was also no consciousness of rank. I recall one tall, golden youth, an army pilot who proved to be, on closer inspection, a much decorated brigadier general in search of likeness.
I can now see Dr. Kinsey as he walks me to the steps that connected mezzanine to lobby. He is a gray-faced man who always wears a polka-dot bow tie. He looks uncommonly tired and has not long to live. Yet he is only fifty-four. He never stops conducting his interviews, all questions and answers, in code. Mrs. Kinsey is concerned about his overworking. Ever since he took up sex, she is quoted as saying, I never see him. Dr. Kinsey was intrigued by my lack of sexual guilt. I told him that it was probably a matter of class. As far as I can tell, none of my family ever suffered from that sort of guilt, a middle-class disorder from which power people seem exempt. We did whatever we wanted to do and thought nothing of it. Kinsey told me that I was not homosexual, doubtless because I never sucked cock or got fucked. Even so, I was setting world records for encounters with anonymous youths, nicely matching busy Jack Kennedy's girl-a-day routine. I would not have had it otherwise, since, even then, I did not believe in fixed sexual categories. And finally, Kinsey appears not to have believed in them either. But one's primary attraction, for the other half is innate and immutable and hardly a choice, as the ignorant pretend. Of course, secondary attractions are possible, hence the tradition in patriarchal societies of a conventional marriage for Jonathan as well as one for David, though their love for each other is the primary fact of their lives. I tried to tell Kinsey about Jimmy, but I had not yet read Plato. I had no theory. Kinsey gave me a copy of Sexual Behavior in the Human Male, with an inscription complimenting me on my work in the field. Thanks, Doc, but it wasn't all work. When Dr. Kinsey had finished with my history, he liked to question you twice, with an interval between, to catch any inconsistencies, I asked, If you didn't know who I was, what, who would you say I was, according to my sexual history? I'd rate you as a lower middle class Jew with more heterosexual than homosexual interests. Curiously, I have lived most of my life with such a person. We part, for good. Were we in my Duluth, I'd have said, We won't see each other again because I'll be going to Europe soon and you'll be dead in 1956, and I'll only get this last look at you in the year 1993 as I type these lines on a portable Olivetti typewriter in Ravello, Italy, long after the Astor Hotel was torn down. Isherwood and I used to play around with the notion of what it would be like to know the entire future of someone we had just met— rather as if we could skip to the back of a book to see how things turned out, as Montaigne always did, eager to read how the protagonist died even before he knew how he had lived. Then, knowing the ending, one would address the new person accordingly. Sorry, I have no time to waste on you. Next summer you'll be dead on Route 9W in a car accident, and by the time I'm sixty-five, I will have forgotten your name. Last Glimpse of Dr. Kinsey he is standing at the top of the broad, carpeted steps. He has a clipboard in one hand. He wears a crew cut. So do I. He has just interviewed me for a proposed study of the homo-heterosexual balance in the arts. There was a suspicion that far too many creative people were inclined to same sexuality, which meant, of course, serious mental illness of the sort that makes truly great and universal art impossible. By the 1950s, an all-out war was declared on the home in turns control of the arts, so like the common turns control of the State Department, a war that still continues into our own enlightened time, led by Christian fundamentalists and neoconservatives, often dedicated to Zion. I have always been intrigued by the phrase the long arm of coincidence, invented by a playwright friend of Somerset Maugham. A letter is placed on my table. It is from T. P. Gore the Second, my first cousin. I have not heard from him in thirty years. He writes from New Jersey. He has enclosed photographs of the graves of Dot and Da and Nina in an Oklahoma City cemetery.
I don't even know the cemetery's name because I have never been to Oklahoma City or, except for one night in Tulsa during the war, in the state at all. I suppose this is partly due to resentment against the people who defeated Da when I was ten years old. Clear color photographs show well tended grounds, a large altar like memorial of gray marble bordered by flowers. On one side, an inscription to Da, on the other, to Dot. Presumably, their remains are in boxes beneath the monument. I read with a magnifying glass Thomas Pryor Gore. Born Webster County, Mississippi, December 10th, 1870. Member of the Council Oklahoma Territory, 7th Legislative Assembly District, 1903 to 1905. Elected United States Senate, 1907 to 1921. Re-elected, 1931 to 1937. Died March 16th, 1949. On that day, St. Patrick's Day, my father and I took a train together from New York City. At noon, we were in the ground floor flat of an apartment house on Wisconsin Avenue, a block or two from the Gore's first Washington house in Mintwood Place. Full circle. Dot wept quietly but talked coherently. He had been laughing at breakfast, joshing me. Then he was in a coma, a stroke. I think he knew what was happening. Next to being blind, this struck me as the worst that could happen to anyone. To be trapped, deaf, dumb, blind, in a motionless body. Three days later, he died. Ancient colleagues came to pay their respects. She greeted each by name, never got a name wrong. Remembered to repeat Mr. Gore's good opinion of the visitor. Da was obsessed with death. But then, blindness is a kind of permanent foretaste, prelude. The Greeks thought that death was the absence of light. In old age, he overcame his fear literally by accident. At the time, I was about twelve years old. One of my St. Albans classmates was the son of the Colombian ambassador to the United States. On a Sunday, I went to have lunch with Alfonso Lopez. I was curious about the gloomy embassy because at the time of the First World War it had been the German legation, and it was from here that righteous Wilson had driven Count Bernstorff from Freedom's Land. The house proved to be appropriately spooky. It became even more so when a servant appeared in the dining room door to say that, according to the radio, Senator and Mrs. Gore have just been killed in an automobile accident. As it turned out, Dot was all right, but Da had suffered a concussion. When consciousness returned, days later, he observed with wonder, I could have been dead all this time, and I'd never have known a thing. That means there's nothing at all to being dead. Years later, Dot came to the same conclusion when, crossing a room, she suffered a stroke. And there I was, falling slowly, slowly to the floor, and I remember thinking, why, this is death, and it's really so pleasant. Unfortunately, she was to survive a number of debilitating strokes. The automobile accident was to be the last blow from Da's ironic fate. Ironic because he was about to go back to Oklahoma City to be re-elected to Congress, this time as a member of the House of Representatives. But his ever-vigilant fate saw to it that Dot's vagueness about left and right had placed them in the wrong lane, and so a truck, not Roosevelt, ended his political career. In Oklahoma there is a fairly large city named Gore, notorious for being one of the most polluted in the United States, thanks to oil refineries and the infamous Union Carbide. There are also numerous lakes, mountains, and streets called Gore, but no proper biography. Although what little remained of his papers did end up in a university, I doubt if there is enough left to reconstruct him. Character is the key word when one thinks of him. Martin Luther's Ich kann nicht anders would have been a good motto for him. I can do no other. On the obverse side, his wife, Nina K. Gore, 
Born Anderson County, Texas, March 28, 1878. Died May 8, 1963. Dot's father was from South Carolina, fought in the Civil War, then moved west. See? She would point to a large daguerreotype of a wild, blue-eyed, bearded man. He looks just like Robert E. Lee. I've never seen the slightest resemblance. Once a year, the Kay family holds a reunion in South Carolina. I have never gone to one, but a cousin writes to me from time to time. Apparently, that ill-starred president Jimmy Carter had a Kay grandmother, too, and so he and I are, according to the family's vast almanac de gata of farmers and mechanicals, fifth cousins twice removed. Whatever that means. Once removed, I suppose, by his election to the presidency, and permanently removed by his defeat. I've never met him. I did send him a telegram after his failed helicopter strike at Tehran. I said that honor required him to resign. Had I known of our relationship, as close as that of Franklin to Theodore Roosevelt, I would have said, family honor. Earlier, I had been invited to the White House, but, rudely, I never acknowledged the invitation. I am told that he proudly mentions T.P. Gore as his cousin, but there is no evidence that he has made a similar claim in regard to me. Anyway, he is a decent man, if an inept politician. A third photograph shows a small slab set in appropriately burnt-out grass. Loving daughter, Nina Gore Olds, 1903 to 1978. There's room for you, too, Dot would say, enticingly. We can take four more. I must say they all look so final now. Their names in gray marble, presumably forever. Their terminal dates at last filled in. Today it is windy, premature autumn. Last night I dreamed of Da for the first time in many years. We are aboard a ship. There is no stateroom ready for him, and I have no ticket, passport. I can't find Dot. The ship pitches slightly, and I hold on to his arm as I used to do when we negotiated difficult terrain. Otherwise, he'd hold my arm. I am worried that he will fall. Then I find a stateroom with an open door and trunks all about. As it is empty of people, I commandeer it. Da is not well, wants to lie down. I help him into a bunk. I'm afraid that the occupants will come back at any moment. Then I notice that my white cat is missing. More anxiety. I search the ship. Cannot find the cat. Cannot find my way back to Da's stateroom. Wake up. Do you dream in pictures? I once asked him. Not often, he said. And when I do, it's always from the time that I could see. I've no idea what Tot, or any of you, looks like. I also can't imagine ladies with painted faces. Change in weather alters mood. Energy returns, though not as it once did. I'm beginning not to mind looking into the past, but I certainly wouldn't want to live there. Once was enough. Da. The happiest time in anyone's life is when he is working to achieve something that is within his capability. But then, once you get what you want, there is a bit of a letdown. Miraculously, he had got to the Senate, but of course he had wanted to be president, but feared, knew indeed, that his blindness would disqualify him. In any case, he could only go so far after the quarrel with Wilson. Finally, influenza removed him from the great stage. At forty-eight, he never again was to recover his full strength or momentum, Curiously, at the same age, my father suffered a near-fatal heart attack, and he too was diminished, never to be the same again. I came as close as I have ever to a nervous breakdown in my forty-eighth year, fearful that I too would share their fate. But I was spared and allowed what they were denied, twenty-two years more or less at full strength. Since one can have no idea what really went on in the lives of those now resident in cemeteries, the novel was invented. Back of gravestone pieties, there are vivid realities. 
Teresa Baxter, the black woman who saw the Gores through old age and into the cemetery, said that whenever Nina rang to say that she was in Washington, Dot would say to Da, Lulu's back in town. Then they would both roar with laughter, plainly some musical joke of the 90s. Nina was very much of the great world. Henry Luce, in my presence, that is, I was in the next room, an unwilling but interested eavesdropper, said that his wife, Claire Booth Luce, did not understand him and would Nina... Later, I told Nina that it would be a good career move all around if she were to marry the proprietor of Time and Life magazines. But though she liked the idea of all the money in the world, she was not about to work for any of it, in or out of bed. The most that she had ever done in the way of quo pro quid was to allow poor Hudy to try to exercise his conjugal rights. Incidentally, it was Hudy who had befriended Luce when both were at Yale. Hudy paid his way to Europe, later gave him money to start Time magazine. The money was repaid without interest. We were obliged to call him Uncle Harry. He had long fingers covered with orange fur like caterpillars. There was something very pure in Nina's selfishness, something truly beguiling in her lack of self-consciousness. Lulu really didn't give a damn. She didn't want to have sex with Uncle Harry, and so she didn't marry him. She did want sex with an Air Force general with no money, becomingly attached to an Air Corps officer called Robert Olds. And she married him, only to bury him a year later when he died of an obscure blood disease. Nina's wit about herself was often appealing. When asked why, after the death of General Olds, she had not married again, she replied, My first husband had three balls, my second two, my third one. Even I know enough not to press my luck. My researcher has found Christine White, as soon as Jimmy Trimble's mother told me about his engagement to Chris White, I rang Joanne to ask her what had become of her old rival. She was astonished at the connection. It had been years since she had seen Christine. Should she check with the various actors' guilds? But I had already done that. No trace of her, unless the guilds were being uncommonly coy. I told her some of the Jimmy story. We agreed that for such a large country... The lines keep crossing, as if the United States were only a village, like Hollywood. Luckily, inevitably, my sometime researcher lives in Washington, D.C., as does Jimmy's mother, and as did Chris White. Chris was found in that ultimate repository of secrets, the telephone book. They met. Chris had given up acting and come home to nurse an ailing mother who had only just died. The researcher recorded their conversation. Christine is writing a book. She is concerned about the State of the Union. She also writes and sometimes works for politicians like Jesse Helms and Dan Quayle. But when Jimmy wrote her what he had written his mother about how the lives of the Marines were being thrown away so that politicians back home might make money, she says that although she had not understood him at the time, now she does. At first, Chris says that she had not wanted to meet Jimmy. He had, as pitcher for St. Albans, defeated her high school's team. Then there was the sharp social division between those in the high schools and those in the private schools, particularly St. Albans, which was considered a snobbish place, and worse, an all-boys school, and so frowned upon by the sexually integrated public school students. But one of Chris's girlfriends sang Jimmy's praises— He's just terrific. He knows jazz, you know. In those days, jazz was so important, and he goes dancing, and he has a fantastic personality and a smile that would just knock the birds out of the trees. You know, stuff like that. They ended up at a basketball game with Jimmy and a friend. They're all like six foot tall. She was charmed. He fell in love. Since they knew each other only three months before he left for good, this must have been the winter of 1943. After the first meeting, I invited him to my New Year's Eve party. So it was only a week before her party that Jimmy and I had our farewell encounter at the Sulgrave Club. Since I told him about Rosalind, he must have told me about Chris. So there's Jimmy. 
He's always holding the floor, talking shop, and then he's like, mix me another bourbon while we're at it. Anything he did, he'd say, listen, I believe in living life to the hilt. If you're going to talk, talk. If you're going to drink, drink. If you're going to dance, dance. That kind of thing. Doing. He was a doer. He was also kind of poetic. Walt Whitman again. Guam. Who? They were definitely going to be married, she says. Would he have objected to her being an actress? She thinks not. I think that this might have been wishful thinking. He was, it seems, fiercely jealous. Someone wrote him to say that Chris had been dating another boy. He wrote me a stinging letter. If you are really stringing me along, you'd better let me know right now. Do you think I'm having fun over here? I mean, it was really loaded. And so he spoke bullets in that letter. Convinced, finally, that the story was not true, he apologized, adding rather balefully, But be careful in the future. From Guam, Jimmy wrote, I want you to resign yourself. I'm going to be a professional baseball player. No two ways about it. And then if I have to teach English in my old age, well then, all right, he said. I also want to write. A tribute to his one and always other self. When his bright day was done, he would be me, too. Certainly one thing that we had in common was the conviction that the bleakest old age would be to teach English. Ruth Sewell gave Chris the diamond ring that Jimmy had wanted her to have. I remember her handing it to me the day she was notified. She was in bed. She couldn't move. I thought, I am marked. Later, Ruth gave me two pictures that were in Jimmy's effects and two letters that had mud all over them from Iwo Jima that he had had in his pocket for me. They had just picked them up out of his uniform and the two pictures of me he had carried with him everywhere. So there it is, and so there they are. It is just as well that she did not know what I now know about his end and that what she took to be mud was volcanic dust mixed with his blood. Someone told her that he had taken communion before his death, but that does not seem in character. For one thing, he was not Catholic or religious at all, as far as I knew. Though if we were really to compliment each other... Chris mentions Jimmy's friend Carter, who had come to St. Albans after I left. But the thing about Carter is that he missed him so much that he really basically went off his rocker. I was at Chapel Hill, and he was at Chapel Hill, so I began to rebound with Carter, and Carter was rebounding with me. He was a really delightful guy. I appreciated him. He had a terrific sense of humor. Good athlete. He was probably Jimmy's basketball partner. All of a sudden, Carter's fraternity brother came down out of the house and said, Something happened to Carter. He's been lying in his bed for three days and hasn't moved. So he had to be removed from college. They diagnosed it as acute depression. Thus, Jimmy's death hit another survivor, but he weathered it and got all right, and then he married. But when I think of that violent reaction, which is probably what Gore is after, in terms of the effect and the impact that a quote-unquote Greek god can have on a group of people within his nucleus, she means Nimbus. Yes, he was a sort of god to us. I look out my window at the Tyrrhenian Sea. Our part of Magna Grecia was once sacred to the great god Pan, a nature deity, a goatish shepherd who played the saxophone, pipe, that is. As Christianity began to obscure our bright world, it was from this wild country that the cry was heard resonating across wide and sea, The great god Pan is dead. In another age, Marvell came up with a nice double meaning. And Pan did, after Syrinx, speed, not as a nymph, but for a reed. Or Calamus, another sort of reed. Sirocco today, wisteria drooping, Judas trees in full bloom. One tulip has opened. My researcher dines with Ruth Sewell and Christine White next month, the search continues, but I still don't know for what. I am struck by just how much living to the hilt Jimmy did before the hilt's blade was in his back. 
I hadn't heard of Billy Holiday until I knew Latouche. Also, despite an alcoholic father, Jimmy is drinking bourbon at seventeen. Because of an alcoholic mother, I drank very little until I was close to thirty. The lines diverge. Chris says that there was no affair, as girls from a family like hers did not do that sort of thing. When I told Joanne this, she was dubious. I came from the same sort of family in Georgia, and we certainly did that sort of thing if we were in love or thought we were. I can't think that an experienced boy like Jimmy would not have made love to her. Most Southerners in that latitude were sexually mature at an early age. On the other hand, sex was not as easy then as it was to be after the war and before AIDS. The back of the car was still the favored venue should the family not be out of the house, while if there were full-time servants, then al fresco was in order, or that airless game room in the cellar. Early maturity also made sex between boys a natural business, though there were certain rules that straight boys generally observed. This weird adjective was unknown to us, by the way. If we had thought that a word was necessary, it would have been normal versus queer, which we were not. We were just messing around. Rules. Boys did not kiss each other, only girls, and many of us thought that kissing had been invented by girls in the first place, because it was not always pleasant for us when the increased estrogen flow made their salivas taste unpleasant. Cocksucking and buggery were unthinkable. Didn't it hurt? Wasn't it dirty? Otherwise, we were true pagans who knew nothing about categories. Obviously, there were sissies, whom we made cruel fun of, and there were dangerous older men, like the one who sat next to me in Keith's theater and put his hand on my crotch. I fled. Every boy I knew had had a similar experience. What we were all up to was a perfectly natural homoeroticism, which some continued for the rest of their lives without lapsing into the physically more complex homosexuality or, for whatever reason, into serious heterosexuality, an avoidance that was the one true heresy which so bewildered and chagrined Anais, goddess of love therapy and astrologist divine. Jimmy was both homoerotic and heteroerotic. I suppose I am curious about the balance between the two in his nature. But then when one lover goes into shock at the news of his death, and another mourns him to the end of his life, we have moved far beyond sex or eroticism and on to the wilder shores of love and shipwreck. I was in Rock Creek Cemetery, standing over a small strip of gray stone that says, James Trimble III, 1925 to 1945. Iwo. I am filming yet another documentary, this time the subject is Washington, D.C. The day is suitably gray and unseasonably cold. I stand for a long time looking down at the inscription while the camera circles me like a buzzard. I keep my mind fairly blank, find it hard to believe that Jimmy has been just bones in a box for half a century. The cemetery is hilly and full of tall trees. There is well-tended grass between the graves. If memory is a theater, not a film, my actors, though they still come when summoned, need pictures and new anecdotes to get them through the old plays, already performed so many times by so many companies in my head. My current Jimmy is blue-eyed and grinning, unlike most of his sad photographs. I stare at the grass, leaves of grass, that covers whatever is left of him. Then, just as the camera cuts away from me to a huge copper beach, back of which is Henry Adams's monument to his wife, a wind starts toward me and the grass at my feet bends toward me, always the same wind effect when I revive this play. Quickly, I bring down the curtain in my head. I had dinner with Christine White in Washington the night after I had been to the cemetery. She still has some of the old beauty that I recalled from television— she showed me snapshots of Jimmy. In one, he is in marine uniform, standing in front of the National Cathedral, begun by Theodore Roosevelt and completed by George Bush, 
the rise and fall of the American Empire dramatized in a single fake Gothic building. Jimmy is smiling for once. A year later, she said, he would lie in state inside. I can't think how a nineteen-year-old marine private would merit a state burial. On the other hand, he was much loved by Washington sports fans. They found this photograph of me in his wallet. She showed me a picture of her youthful self. The photograph has been bent into a curve. It still follows, she said, the shape of his body. There, on the dining room table in Willard's Hotel, was the outline of the curve made by Jimmy's buttock. I don't know why I found this somehow shocking. Two other photographs are taken in what looks to be the head or bathroom of a troop ship. Another boy stands back of him at a wash basin. Jimmy's expression is sad. A final photograph of him with what I take to be his fellow scouts on Iwo Jima. He is unsmiling. He stares straight at the camera, at me. Christine had only known him three months before he went overseas. But he cannot be forgotten, she said. Will not be forgotten, I amend, thinking of the cemetery and the sudden soft wind rippling May-green grass.